Ready to go? Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to the additional public hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates 2021-2022. Before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay respect to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals present. I welcome President Matthew Mason Cox and the accompanying officials to, to this hearing. Today the committee will examine the proposal the proposed expenditure for the portfolio of the Legislature. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about procedures for today's hearing. Today's proceedings are being broadcast live from the Parliament's website and a transcript will be placed on the Committee's website once it becomes available. In accordance with broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the Committee's proceedings. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness would could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, that should be done through the committee staff. President, I remind you and the officers accompanying you that you are free to pass notes and refer directly to your advisers seated at the table behind you, although I don't see a table behind you. They must be invisible. <laughs> and finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing? All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. President Mason Cox, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you have already been sworn, as you already sworn an oath to your office as a Member of Parliament. I also would like to remind the following witnesses that you do not need to be sworn as you have been sworn in earlier budget estimates hearings before this committee. Uh, Mr David Blunt, Clerk of the Parliaments and Clerk of the Legislative Council, Department of the Legislative Council and Mr Mark Webb, Chief Executive, Department of Primary Services. For all other witnesses, I ask that you each in turn state your full name, position, title and agency, swear either an oath or an affirmation. The words of both the oath and the affirmation are on cards on the table in front of you. That only leaves you, Ms Webb. I'm Jocelyn Dale Webb, Director of Financial Service and Governance, Department of Parliamentary Services. I swear that the evidence about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Um, today's hearing questioning will be on a free flow basis, so you may get it from all angles. And even the government's going to ask questions today, which is yes, going to be interesting. The question is whether you can answer them. Um, <laughs> we'll start with the opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I might just um, uh, take you to um, uh, the area of policy, uh, policies in general, President, and policy consultation surrounding those policies. Um, I just wanted to ask you, is there a consultation policy in force in the New South Wales Parliament? I'm referring now specifically to the suite of policies that the Parliament has. Well, the, the undertaking, um, as I understand it, and I'll ask Mr Webb to expand upon this, is that uh, policies are reviewed every four years or during... Excuse me, you might pull that mic a little closer, please. Okay. I will. Maybe, yeah, that's... Lean a bit forward. Um, my understanding is that uh, policies are reviewed on a four-year cycle every term, um, and uh, in that regard, uh, consultation is obviously the hallmark of that policy review, uh, depending on the nature of the policy being reviewed. And in that regard, uh, I'm advised that there is a backlog that uh, does need to be addressed and is in the process of being addressed. I might ask Mr Webb to to make some remarks about that, but it's very important that obviously the policies of Parliament are subject to that regular review process and you might note that uh, we are reviewing the, the uh, harassment um, um, and sexual harassment and uh, policies at the moment through the, the Broderick Review and indeed uh, a lot of work has also gone into fatigue management over the last uh, six to 12 months as a result of the extended hours of sitting of the House. But with those few introductory comments, I might just ask Mr Webb to reflect on where we're up to in that whole policy review process and particularly which policies 
uh, are currently being reviewed and indeed the backlog and when we look, they're looking to address that. Can I just, before you um, then that, uh, Mr Webb, can I just ask, is, like, so is there a formal policy to consult uh, is, is, I guess, is what? Yeah, uh, I, I can talk to that if you... Uh, uh, yeah, so to the point of consultation, we, um, uh, if it is a policy relating to safety uh, matters, we have a formal position that the consultation process is through the Work Health and Safety Advisory uh, Committee. Um, last year, the Jolt Joint Consultative Committee, which is our um, consultation process with unions, uh, put in a request that for policies with a staffing uh, impact that we use the JCC as a consultation uh, mechanism to ensure staff um, uh, views are taken into place. We have agreed to that. I, I would say uh, one of the major reasons that we have a bit of a backlog at the moment is that the same people that do the policy review within my uh, department are the people that have been running the COVID response over the last couple of years. And with the uh, Omicron uh, outbreak last year, since we made that agreement with the JCC, we haven't actually had any policies come forward for consultation, but we have agreed uh, that we would uh, use that mechanism for consultation. Uh, but we do have a legal obligation to consult through the Work Health and Safety Committee, so that would be anything that would trump uh, that uh, that requirement. So, so prior to the to the JCC airing of this, there was no formal consultation mechanism with members or staff on policies that actually affected their day to day working environment? We tended to do it more on a policy by policy basis, so looked at who was affected by the policy. So we didn't have a, if you like, a global uh, position on consultation except for the work health and safety uh, area that I talked about. We tended to look at the impact of a particular policy and, and look at a consultation measure on a on a case by case basis. It was a good suggestion by the JCC, so we were happy to we were happy to take it up. Uh, as I say, unfortunately, we've not actually put it into practice yet, but that's because we haven't put any policies uh, forward uh, because of the. Can I ask then if that if that was agreed to at the JCC, is there a proposal to actually solidify that in a consultation policy? In other words. Happy to look at that. We, we, I don't have anything like that in front of me at the moment, but I, I don't have any objection to it either. So, because yeah, I, I would have thought that that would be a threshold minimum for um, policies that actually affect, as I said, the working environment and conditions of both members and staff. Sh I would have thought it should be a formal policy in place that requires you to consult. In that collaborative way. Yeah, no, ha ha happy to. I have no objection to that. That that is the philosophy we try to take into the policy development. So I have no problems with uh, formalising it. Can I ask? Um, can I ask how many policies on the New South Wales Parliament intranet are actually in force? Uh, Apparently, there's a ton of them on there, but how many are actually in force? There is. Um, there's all of the ones on the intranet are in force. Some of them are out of date, though, because of the backlog that I referred to before. So uh, we, we are meant, as the president said, we're meant to review them every four years. Um, and there are quite a few there that haven't <laughs> been reviewed in the last four years. They're still in force, but they do need to be reviewed. Okay, so we could potentially have policies on there that are. Um, that are so far out of date that they're almost irrelevant. Yeah, that, that would be my concern. We, we've, uh, in terms of how we've prioritised the policies, we have gone to the oldest ones uh, first, but uh, I couldn't tell you that uh, there are still some that are quite out of date that we need to work through. If I could just add one observation there. Just because a policy is old doesn't mean that it's not still important. Um, a good example is the um, Code of Conduct for Member Staff. Um, that um, dates from some years ago, but it's still vitally important and the provisions of it uh, uh, remain current. It is, is, my only concern is, is that you could have a perverse effect whereby um, a part of a, an outdated policy may actually be counterproductive if it was written you know, 10 years ago and things have moved on for whatever reason. So. Anyway, um, uh, I think that's important. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. Uh, David's right. Sometimes when we look at a policy, it, it's still relevant, makes sense. Yeah. We update the date and uh, don't make many more changes. But um, which is again why consultation is so yeah. critical because you'll sort of align the two with reality based yeah. on. Absolutely, that's, that's. Can I ask? Can I ask? Um, 
in October of 2021 in answers to supplementary questions submitted for this portfolio. Uh, it was said that the New South Wales Parliament House closed circuit television and security access control systems policy are due to be reviewed in 2022, which we're obviously now in. Uh, have the reviews commenced? No, not yet. Okay. Um, how many policies, do we know how many policies uh, that are relevant to the employment of members' staff uh, have been updated in the previous 12 months without any consultation being conducted prior to the policy being updated or changed? I guess this relates to uh, the context of the previous questions, but um, yeah, the question is, are there any policies that re relate to the employment of members' staff that have been updated in the previous 12 months without any consultation? I'd have to take that on notice. Sorry, I don't have that information in front of me. Right. Um, that sort of um, ties up the policy section. I might just take you to... Um, um, Could we... Sorry, before yeah. you go off of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Go, go. Perhaps, got... I think, sort of related then is the, um, the work that's being um, done in relation to the independent complaints officer. Mm -hmm. Um, which I know is work in progress. We've had updates. That's been very good, the, the consultation that we've had there. Um, one of the things that the um, complaints officer is not set up to do is to deal with um, complaints around sexual assault and harassment, my understanding. Um, perhaps you could clarify what's being done. Are we waiting for the project review to come back before putting that independent um, uh, complaints mechanism in place or is there work being done on that in the meantime? Okay. Um, in relation to the complaints officer, it's stalled, if you like, in the Legislative Council, as you'd be aware. Uh, there have been discussions between the respective privileges committees to iron out the, the last detail or two. Uh, as I understand it, um, those discussions have not brought it to a conclusion and there are so other discussions occurring behind the scenes and perhaps I might ask the clerk to reflect on that because he's a lot closer to it than I am. So uh, um, as you're aware, there is a motion currently before the House, um, debate on which was adjourned until uh, the first sitting day in this year. It was then um, postponed last week until the first sitting day in March. So it will be, it's on the notice paper as a matter of business of the House for the 22nd of March, the potential consideration by the House then. Um, at the briefing session that the Deputy Clerk and I provided to members and your staff a couple of weeks ago at the request of the Privileges Committee, um, the question you're asking now is one of the ones that was um, uh, addressed then. and. Through that discussion and um, subsequent consultation um, and review of the detail of the, um, the reports of the Privileges Committees, um, what I can say is in relation to sexual harassment, um, the, it's very clear that the terms of reference for the um, independent complaints officer includes bullying and harassment. Mm -hmm. Of course, harassment includes more than just sexual harassment. Um, in relation to sexual harassment, the Anti-Discrimination Act um, includes a, a very specific provision in relation to members of parliament and other participants in the parliamentary workplace, a provision that I think is not well understood or, you know, remembered by everyone here. but. It is there. It pro proscribes sexual harassment um, by and of members of parliament and um, ultimately if a complaint is taken to the anti-discrimination board within 12 months of the event, um, if not conciliated, there can be potentially a fine of up to $110,000 um, for which a member or anyone else um, who... Uh, is the harasser um, would be personally liable. So, so that's an important piece of information that I think all, all members and everyone else in the parliamentary workplace should be aware of. Um, hopefully that will have a salutary impact, just that, it, it, that 
process of education. But um, it, it, it's, in, it's envisaged that the independent complaints officer um, will uh, develop a protocol with the anti-discrimination board that would um, uh, address the detail of the sorts of matters that would be referred by the independent complaints officer to the anti-discrimination board because of their expertise and experience in this field and which matters the independent complaints officer would deal with themselves. Um, given that the independent complaints officer is envisaged to be there to deal with complaints about members' conduct in an expeditious and confidential manner, um, it would be um, expected that the sorts of complaints that can be dealt with quickly and confidentially would indeed be dealt with by the independent complaints officer, whereas perhaps more complex ones uh, where the expertise of the ADB would, would be of assistance might be referred. But that, would, that detail would be worked out between the officer and the ADB. So from a practical perspective then, if we have a um, person within Parliament who is, has experienced... Um, sexual harassment or, or, or assault. I mean, often people aren't aware of the difference um, when they're experiencing it. Um, and on the assumption that the complaints officer is in place, um, would the complaints officer be set up to then confidentially handle that without being obliged to, I guess, take action that's not necessarily what the complainant would want? For example, a complainant might want some sort of intervention in the in the um, circumstance they might want education of the, um, the person they're complaining against or will they be obliged will the complaints officer be obliged to involve the ADB um, again that will be a matter to be determined in that um, protocol that's developed between the independent complaints officer and the ADB but as a matter of principle general principle in relation to the uh, the proposal that's before the House um, in relation to harassment of any kind, whether it's sexual harassment or otherwise, or, or bullying, um, there are particular provisions around confidentiality mm -hmm. and um, uh, matters are to essentially remain confidential um, uh, unless the, so that if the complainant does not want the matter to be made public, it won't be. Um, that, that, that's one really important uh, feature. But the, exactly the sorts of rectification steps that you've just described would be um, precisely what's envisaged um, by the proposal that's before the House. Those sorts of um, immediate, timely, practical ways of resolving matters so that there is some, you know, change in behaviour. Um, and if the rectification steps that the independent complaints officer recommends are not implemented um, or not accepted by the member, then the matter gets escalated to the Privileges Committee. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just, just like to add... Um, that first part of your question about whether this is something that the um, Roderick Review is looking at and whether it's waiting for that Roderick Review to, to comment on it before it is put in place. The two are separate. The Roderick Review will no doubt comment on the proposals that Parliament puts up and both the Speaker and I are very keen to progress this and to have the complaints officer put in place as soon as possible. But it's not subject to the Roderick Review, but the Roderick Review will no doubt upon what has been done. And there is a review provision, isn't there, in, w within that proposal that the House is yes, to consider? Yes. So um, if within 12 months, so, so before the end of the parliamentary term. So if, the, if um, we got feedback yes. um, from Ms Broderick that perhaps we could improve it in some way, that could be then considered, but at least then we'd have it in place to begin with. Absolutely. We could improve upon it. Yes. Okay. Uh, chair. Chair, uh, just, that was just to follow up on those questions with regards to the Broderick report. Um, you've just indicated, um, Mr. Blunt, that the time frame for reporting is within 12 months. Is that right? The, bro the, bro uh, the review. The, yes. Uh, um, 
Well, sorry, it was probably best for Mr. President or Mark to... I can comment on that. The sure. Broderick Review is planned to conclude in probably May or June, which is subject to, obviously, the, the current phase of consultation uh, which is occurring, uh, the, the survey that's gone out to all people affected, uh, that they, the feedback from that is now being assessed. Um, indeed, um, the uh, process in that is coming to its conclusion, but on that will form a very important part of the report, the quantitative analysis, which of, of course will be there with the qualitative analysis and the interviews that have been held with, with members and their staff and, and people who have availed themselves of that option through that process. So all that material, uh, that data, will be uh, the foundation for the report which we anticipate based on current uh, sort of expectations to be May, June. But we'll, we'll have a better idea of that once the, the data has been fully assessed. Will the report be released around that time? Made yes. public to be made public, yes. Around that time. Um, what resources have been allocated to the implementation of the rec recommendations uh, as far as um, you know uh, with the Broderick report? Well, we don't know what the recommendations are, but uh, once we uh, are certainly uh, in, have those recommendations presented to us, there'll be a, a quick and timely response in that regard uh, and an assessment of, of the cost implications. But let me assure you, uh, Mr Musselmane, that yeah. uh, the Parliament takes its responsibilities in this area very seriously and will be acting to remediate uh, whatever needs to be remediated. I should note in that regard that a policy review has already been done by um, uh, Ms Broderick uh, in terms of the current policy framework and uh, there are some identification of some areas where we could improve and those improvements are already in play and, uh, and those policies are being updated as we go to ensure that we have the, the model, the best, the absolute best system in place to ensure that uh, this is an exemplar here in Parliament, as it should be, for um, all businesses and all um, operations, all organisations across New South Wales. How is the recommendations envisaged to be supervised? Uh, uh, is it by uh, an advisory group? Uh, what's the... We do have a, a, an advisory group that's been established. Be aware that the Deputy Speaker is the chair of that advisory group and uh, that has members involved in it. Uh, that has uh, staff members from across uh, the parliament uh, and that, that group is working very closely uh, with the, um, the actual executive team as well as with the Broderick Review who are reporting regularly and interacting with that group regularly. So we envisage uh, that um, uh, the implementation phase, depending on what the recommendations are, will be a close uh, working relationship with that advisory group mm. and with the executive of the parliament ensure that we're able to implement those recommendations as, as necessary. Mr President, is the um, government, uh, uh, will the government provide a response to the Broderick Review, do you know, um, that would it be put in front of the government to provide a, a response? Well, the Broderick Review has been commissioned by the Executive Group of Parliament. Yes. So the, the Executive Group of Parliament will be providing a response. Uh, and in that regard, the government has commissioned a report uh, by Prue Goward um, and uh, indeed uh, that is a process that uh, is still ongoing as I'm aware um, and I'm not sure about the timing of that but obviously that's an issue that is for government to consider given it relates to their commissioning of that report so I don't expect uh, the government will be responding in relation to a parliamentary no. report commissioned by parliament. But Oh, Please. Mr Webb just suggested unless we, we require further resources in, in order to implement it, but of course that is always an ongoing issue uh, with Parliament and the Executive, the, the need to ensure that uh, this place in whatever form is adequately resourced uh, and that uh, will continue to be something we fight, we fight as hard as we can for. Thank you. Well, I was going to go to the matter of staffing, which is very important I want to get to, but since you've segue us into that uh, that area, President, we might just go to the issue of the legislature budget because I think it's very, very important. Um, I, uh, 
I just want to basically, for a start, traverse where we're up to. My recollection is is that there was a um, there was a uh, hearing by the PAC, which handed down a recommendation for an independent funding model. This is the perennial problem of the leg legislature being uh, subservient to the funding by Treasury, and there's uh, what what we can gather. A, a, pretty big misalignment of demand for funds versus supply in terms of the capital budget and others, other things. So the PAC recommended an independent funding model, I think, on the same line, along the same lines as the UK model, um, whereby we would be, we would be uh, quarantined in the appropriation bills for a certain amount of money, but we would still have to put forward a business case. Uh, and I understand that, um, that uh, the chairs uh, has a bill which is currently residing in the LA to give effect to that. Uh, did you want to just give us an update on where that's at and the rationale behind all that? Yes, that would be um, a great opportunity to reflect on some of the issues that Parliament faces in terms of its capital budget particularly. But um, just by way of background, as I understand it, the Public Accountability Committee, uh, which at the time I was a member of, um, reviewed uh, the the, the budgetary position and whilst uh, the Parliament uh, as, as we all know is subject to the vagaries of putting a budget forward and uh, dealing with the executive um, and ERC through that process and out the end uh, through a somewhat opaque process comes a budget for Parliament which we make work as best we can. Um, in, in regard to the PAC recommendations I think the preferred model was the House of Commons model uh, but there was a couple of alternatives there, one being that uh, the Public Accountability Committee act as, if you like, the reviewer of the um, Legislative Council budget. The Public Accounts Committee similarly act in relation to the Legislative Assembly and that a joint committee of sorts act in relation to the joint responsibilities of Parliament, of the DPS responsibilities, um, and that together uh, a full budget for Parliament be, um, be, be worked out and then be submitted to, to Treasury um, and then if the Treasurer in, wishes to quibble with that then that is detailed in the Treasurer's speech to Parliament and explained um, and that was the model that I believe was encapsulated in the, uh, the bill that has passed the Legislative Council that was brought in by, by the Chair and is in the Legislative Assembly. So I'm not sure where that goes from here. We haven't had a response from government in that regard. It's still something that's on the notice paper in the Legislative Assembly. And that, so that, if, I'm, if I hear you correctly, uh, President, that means that the Treasurer would still have veto over the proposition, but it, the point is, is that it would become a publicly available document subject to debate and there would have to be some right. reason as to why. That's right. So and, the, and in the UK, by and large, this sort of, this works. I'm, I'm well, the UK is probably a step further towards independence in, in that they work out the budget and that's it. It's delivered and, and it's put in the, the Treasury um, budget documents. Uh, whereas this model is a step back from that in that you'd have an independent process uh, which would be overseen by those respective committees mm. and through that process a budget determined uh, and, and that would be obviously a public inquiry with Treasury officials coming, with other stakeholders coming and uh, we'd be able to, or the committee would be able to um, hear from the clerk and from DPS and other stakeholders in relation to that budget, understand the needs of Parliament, uh, be able to independently assess all those, all that material, come to an independent sort of view as to what an appropriate budget is, put it to the Treasurer and the Treasurer then would have to make a decision obviously based on their own internal advice and, and other issues that uh, a government has to balance the priorities uh, of its budget and would come back with a figure to Parliament uh, which would then be discussed uh, if there is a variance in the, the actual Treasurer's contribution to Parliament. And I ask, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps Mr Blunt, I in terms of the status of the uh, the Borzak bill, um, what, is, am I correct in saying that they were waiting on 
the recommendations of the PAC and then they've asked for extensions to respond to the PAC before we deal with the bill or is that not necessarily correct? I'm just trying to get a handle on why we haven't had a response from the government on any of this stuff. Um, I might just ask the staff who are listening in if they can just send me an update as to where we're at in terms of the government response to the PAC uh, reports, but in terms of um, Mr Borzak's bill, that's um, solely a matter for the Legislative Assembly now as to um, the programming of, of, of that bill in terms of other, other private members' uh, bills that are before that House. Okay. I might, we might just go to some specifics, I think, just to tease out some of the issues surrounding this issue. Um, how much of this financial year's um, allocated budget has been spent? Uh, we're on track at the moment. I, in terms of an exact percentage, I'd have to take on notice, but we're on track to expend uh, what we've been allocated this year. Okay. So we're in, what, well, we're in March, so we're kind of like... Three quarters of the way through. Yeah. Uh, I would say um, the construction, there's one exception to that, the construction pause that happened at the start of the financial year meant that two of our major projects, the um, in particular the membrane uh, project had to pause for three months. So that expenditure is on track from a project point of view, but it's all deferred for three months. So we're going to have to move a little bit of money catch into up. next financial year to catch up. Okay. But, yeah. uh, uh, but besides that, yes. Um, in terms of the overall budgetary restraints from Treasury, which we touched on in, that, in the introduction from the President, um, in the context of the money that's required simply remediate the building. We're not talking about capital improvements now, in, in just remediation and depreciation. Can you give us a feel for the, the gaps there? We've, we've done quite a bit of work in this regard, but, and the advice that, that I have uh, is that um, we're talking a figure for, uh, over the last 20 years where there hasn't been a proper allocation of funding for what I'd call remediation and maintenance and up, up, upgrading the building as, as needed. The figure is around about $188 million. Um, and looking forward, uh, we've got some serious remedi remediation issues that, that must be addressed in, in the near term. And if, if they're not... Oh, sorry, President, $188 million is what we need just to get it up to scratch. And what have we got in the kitty? Well, we get $2.9 million uh, in a budget uh, each year for minor capital works. And then we need to... Make, put forward a business case in relation to other aspects, for example, the, the IT uh, rejuvenation process, uh, the, the membrane of the building, which was uh, creating, creating leaks. You might have seen with some of the weather, some of that leaking is still there. And that's a, in phase four of that project, which is about an $18 million spend. So we're, we're addressing some of those pretty fundamental issues. You, you might remember the, the, uh, the leaking in the Jubilee Room. Mm. Uh, uh, which uh, was, was quite significant and affected a, a large number of books. Actually, there was leaking into the into the Legislative Council for, for court area outside the chamber as well. And uh, sadly, there's there's some uh, leaking in the chamber itself. So we have some serious issues. We 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 are you know, occupying you know the oldest public building here in Australia. It has significant heritage value, it's really a priceless piece of our heritage and in that regard we just simply have not invested in ensuring that uh, it's fit for purpose. There are occupational health and safety issues as a result and uh, we have parts of the building that are, 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 are not able to be accessed. For example, the second storey balcony we, is now a no-go area because there's wood rot on the balcony and uh, it, it's dangerous and so staff have been advised not to access the, the second floor balcony of the, the Rump Hospital. And, uh, and one example which I, I always shocks me is that we had uh, some remediation, I think it was last year, and a humidifier was put in the chamber, the Legislative Council chamber, and overnight it took out 21 litres, or sorry, 29 litres of water, uh, which underpins the problem we have with mould. Mm. Uh, in that chamber, and there are a number of members who are affected by that, uh, and have have um, come directly to me raising those concerns. 
I've got to say, as a, as a former asthmatic, I'm affected by it as well. And, and the mould and the, um, the overarching moist, moisture in that building, uh, I think, is becoming a, a significant occupational and health and safety issue for members who have to work in the parliament itself, not to mention visitors, not to mention uh, the other precincts that uh, are affected by this are along the whole RUM hospital. Mm. So one of the, the key issues, I think, is to address that in the near future, and that's certainly what the parliament will be putting forward to the executive in relation to uh, urgent remediation works. Okay. Can I, President, can I, so we've got remediation and, and, and what seems like fairly urgent um, WHS issues that have to be addressed. It's not a like I would like. It's mm -hmm. Then you've got the, the issue of the actual accommodation and the adequacy of the accommodation to house people, staff. But I want to go particularly to the press gallery. Um, and I understand the Guardian's got temporary spots um, at the moment. Is what, Where are we in terms of budgetary requirements to accommodate necessary expansion of the press gallery and in particular um, spots for the Guardian. Chair, I wonder if before we go off this um, topic I might just be able to ask one follow-up uh, Yeah, sure. To, um, well, uh, please do. President, President um, um, I uh, warmly endorse uh, what you're saying about the importance in um, uh, investing in the uh, fabric of uh, what is an important public building uh, and indeed a historic heritage building. Um, it is the case, though, in the last 10 years, there has been more than, um, uh, well, more than 80 million, almost 100 million spent uh, on upgrading the building, isn't it? Uh, which have ad addressed issues like um, WHS in the kitchen, food health safety issues in the kitchen, uh, WHS uh, S offices in members' offices uh, in terms of uh, furniture, uh, and um, uh, various other upgrades to the building as well to make it more functional. Yes, so that, that is true, um, and it's simply a question of, of ensuring that we have adequate funding in relation to some of those more neglected parts of the building. Yes, um, mm. um, uh, Mr Harwin, you're absolutely right that uh, there has been Perhaps some investment. I'd, I'd characterise it rather than neglected. Um, things that were on the list... Yes. <laughs> Well, uh, it's that, been a long uh, list. That weren't addressed yes. um, uh, after the uh, initial 80 to 100 million. That's that, right. And uh, indeed, the, the investment in the Jubilee Room was um, a wonderful investment and that, that uh, sadly was undermined by the massive leak, which uh, we had, mm. um, which uh, had, we're still recovering from. We got to the bottom of whether that was caused by faulty work when constructing a building over the top of it. Yes, well, the feedback we've had is that um, uh, there's a, there was an issue with blockages of drain pipes and the like. Um, so we were pleased in some ways that uh, that was addressed then rather than with the amount of rain we've had recently yeah. and we're about to receive because I think the impact would have been so much more severe. But did you want to comment on that, Mr Webb? Uh, yes. I just ask, uh, just, uh, just, in, just as a little bit of a like an addendum because you might want to cover it in the... To put that into context, though, if it's 80 million over 10 years, roughly 8 million a year on average, but you're, what you, on evidence that you put on before in a previous answer, you're saying that we need 108, almost 200 million just to bring things up to scratch. Yeah, so. Um, One year. I, well, yeah, sorry. I, and, and I should say that if. if even if $180 million was, was available, we couldn't... In the, in the 15 years That's right. Before. I, I, I should say, to, <laughs> to support what Mr Harwin was saying, in the 10 years prior, in the first 10 years of this millennium, the average investment in the parliament was more in the nature of three and a half to $4 million. Mm -hmm. At, uh, 2011, from 2011 onwards, that jumped up to closer to $10 million uh, a year uh, and made a huge uh, difference. Uh, we would have uh, been in much worse shape if that had sure. uh, happened. Yeah, yeah. But you, what you're saying is quite right. Yeah, the investment needed to catch up is probably more in the order of $25 uh, million uh, a year if we wanted to catch up everything that so needs to be so done. So credit where it's due, yes, but we've still got a ton of... Yes, you know, that's, yeah. that's exactly right. The, the interventions that were made in the early 2010s made a massive difference. The, I, honestly, there would be parts of the building that would be uninhabitable if not for that... Uh, that um, 
uh, 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 advocacy that was done at the time. In the circumstances, uh, uh, we submitted uh, urgent requests from the government to say, look, this is the... I know, I know you, would, you may have done that. Uh, other um, uh, leadership uh, presidency have done it. Um, that it's urgent that we need this money uh, to repair. Otherwise, the cost of repair will double or triple, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, in time. Have we made submissions? They, they certainly have been made. Um, and look, uh, it's probably worth looking at, at, the, at the sort of future prospects because you know, we've, we've had an assessment that over the next 10 years, if we, we don't receive uh, significant investment above what I'd call the, the minor capital works budget, which is $2.9 million a year, that it's anticipated that deficit will grow between another 200 and $250 million. Mm. So this position is dire. Yeah. And uh, as, as uh, the Honourable Don Harwin pointed out, there's parts of the building that have, have received some investment and that, that's been very welcome. And indeed, recently in relation to the, the, um, the government's position about trying to accelerate investment more generally in the economy, uh, there were submissions taken uh, to um, boost economic activity and one of those through the COVID period, one of those was the membrane to the, to the, to the actual building which is an $18 million investment over a number of years. But the reality is there are some very neglected parts of the building. Probably the most neglected is the old Rum Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I, I have some pictures here which might be useful to members which uh, really explain that in a bit more detail. If that was satisfactory, Chair, I could uh, table those. And I think it's worthwhile just um, having a look at those uh, because they really run through some of the more obvious issues that um, you can see with the naked eye. But sitting behind that, there are some serious uh, issues uh, that um, require significant investment. And that's, that's certainly the subject of uh, our budget bid, uh, which we uh, are making to government uh, for the next budget which we've actually parceled under, under the, bar, the bicentenary in order to, to ensure that um, the, the parliament is in such a form for a, a potential visit from uh, uh, the, the royal family, should that come to pass, or indeed uh, we have it uh, in November, the um, holding by the New South Wales Parliament of the International Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Conference and Congress here, which will be obviously involving parliaments with many members of parliament from overseas coming to this place as well as the convention centre which will be the primary place for hosting of the conference proper. Could I ask you just on the back of that, so clearly there's some very urgent and quite dire maintenance issues that are required and as you say just to bring things back up to a standard where they're not going to further deteriorate. Um, are there also opportunities to build in um, better technology and accessibility, um, particularly uh, when I'm talking about accessibility for people with disability. Um, yes. Are there opportunities to build that in at the same time or is that going to cost uh, more money? That, that is indeed part of the, the bid that we're putting forward to the executive. Uh, one of the issues is disability access uh, through the front of the building. Uh, that's part of the, the bid and uh, detailed proposal has been put forward in that regard. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's an opportunity to look at the facade of, of Parliament as well, which is, hasn't been painted for 40 odd years. And uh, if you have a look, that looks, there's some pretty ex gross examples in some of those pages. But we, we are also conscious of the Macquarie East project itself and the sandstone quarter, if you like, of the city. And uh, we, we are advised that uh, the Mint, which is the sister building to, to our building, um, will be um, uh, renovated and the facade will go back to its traditional facade of, of the sandstone and, and, and lime. And so there is a, a strong view uh, amongst um, some stakeholders that we look to update the facade of Parliament so that it's um, complementary to that. And there are some proposals that uh, are being considered in that regard. So moving away from the salmon and going back to the traditional sandstone, which is in keeping with uh, also the uh, natural heritage of the sandstone quarter and indeed um, would also improve the occupational health and safety aspects of the building because sandstone is more porous and will allow 
allow the ventilation of the building to be much more efficient in that regard. President, can I take you back to the um, that part of my question about the, the, the accommodation for the press gallery and specifically the Guardian? Where, where's all that up to? Well, I know that space is at an absolute premium, so I might just ask Mr Webb to comment on that specifically. Just not. But anyway. Uh, um, so as you know, we updated the press gallery uh, space a couple of years ago. Uh, on my trusty team at the end of my computer tell me the Guardian has a, a permanent spot in that uh, in that space. If we were to extend, uh, we, we are utilising pretty much, there's a little bit of space left down in the press gallery area, but we are utilising pretty much all uh, of it. Uh, so if it was to be extended any further, we would have to find a location for uh, to, to extend it to. And at this point, um, uh, there's not anything contiguous with the current press gallery that we could expand into. Okay, so they're, they're permanently accommodated now, I think. Okay. Uh, I, look, I just want to go through a couple of um, um, numbers, I suppose, if you like. Feel free to take them on notice, but I think it's important to inform the committee um, around some of the detail <clears throat> of the context we just had. In terms of the next tranche of capital works planned for the next financial year, um, can you tell us uh, what that is? In terms of the stuff that's already yeah. been uh, approved, uh, you want a dollar uh, figure? Uh, well, it, it, it's um, the dollar figure and what sort of capital works we're looking at. Yeah. So um, I might get my trusty team to send me through the dollar figure sure. while I tell you about what, what's planned for next year. So at the moment, the last stages of the roof membrane project is one of the major um, uh, things that we're working on. Um, we're in stage four, we're implementing stage four of five, uh, stage five um, uh, will occur next year. We're also looking at a replacement of the skylight on level 12, which is uh, over 40 years old and is not very um, thermally sound. Uh, a lot of heat gets in uh, and uh, and half the leaks we have in the roof are through seals around the, the, the skylight. So we're looking to replace that skylight uh, as well as part of that project. So that's one of our major uh, projects for, for next year. The digital transformation uh, project will continue. It was a three-year uh, program that was approved, so this is the second year of that three years, so that will continue uh, into next year. Um, I think you would have all, everyone here would have been moved over to Microsoft uh, 365. Yes. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of moving the LA over uh, as well at the moment. Uh, but that's a starting point for then starting to add some uh, extra features and, and uh, ability for people to work more mobilely uh, and the like. But um, Wi-Fi, uh, more modern Wi-Fi is being installed around the building. We've, uh, we're in the process. We've doubled the internet pipeline into the into the parliament. Um, we're working on electric offices. Does that mean we'll, we'll be availed of um, the, of five G when it when it happens? Uh, so we're working with the telecommunications company on that. So the Wi-Fi network is for Wi-Fi, but. Uh, to, in order to get 5G, we need to work with the telecommunications company to have them install the right antennas for, uh, for 5G. Um, uh, we've got good working relationships with um, uh, Telstra and Optus, uh, which we'll continue to work on. I do know that some people that are on Vodafone, uh, since the building was uh, the, across the road went back up uh, again, the signal strength for Vodafone has dropped quite a lot in, in the building, which probably tells me their antenna mm. is somewhere behind uh, mm. that building. Um, so that would be the other area we want to work for, because I, I think if you've got Vodafone and you're on the domain side of the building, the signal strength drops away uh, pretty dramatically uh, by the okay. time you get over In terms over of the Wi-Fi, uh, wi does it cover all uh, parking floors? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll be installing it through the parking uh, area, um, but also we're focusing first. There's, we've gone around, um, you might have seen people walking around with a Ghostbusters-style okay. detector, you know, beep, 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 beep kind of stuff. Um, uh, where they're looking Ghost at... of politicians past. <laughs> it could be. Uh, um, that might explain some of the readings we've got uh, around yeah. the place. So. Um, but I never uh, leave. Yeah, that's right. But um, what we've been looking for is uh, dead zones and weak spots. Um, a lot of the walls in the building are quite thick, um, and uh, so you could have a Wi-Fi repeater sort of there, but if there's a big wall, the signal strength can drop off quite dramatically just you know a few metres down the track. So what, we, what we've been doing is identifying those areas where the Wi-Fi network is weakest and focusing on them first. 
Um, but all uh, over the next uh, 12 months or so, all the Wi-Fi uh, repeaters will be replaced with modern, stronger uh, Wi-Fi networks. So we should have good signal throughout the entire uh, building. Members have told us that's uh, important, especially if you're coming down to a committee and then going back up to your office, having that strong Wi-Fi is an important uh, part there. Um, uh, we've done some trials in the building uh, on the new technology that we're using, and the people in those areas have said it's made an incredible difference to the to the strength of the Wi-Fi network. So a lot of digital transformation that's heading into its third uh, year. We'll also be preparing the cases for future investment because technology doesn't stand still. So we need to continue to invest in technology to make sure that goes through. That digital transformation also includes improvements to what's called the Parliament Information Management System or PIMS. Um, and that's the system that's used to manage the business of the parliament in the chamber in particular, uh, and the Hansard production system, so further improvements in the Hansard production system as well. Is there, is, Mark, is there any, is there any um, I know I've raised this before, but is part of that digital transformation a proposition to have an app for members and staff that helps them navigate their way around the parliament rather than the sort of website yeah, there's there's quite a few uh, things. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at um, bringing up to date uh, old systems that are past their useful life. That's where the focus has been in the first couple of years. As we get to the end of that, then a whole bunch of stuff comes up. Um, uh, the clerk of the LA would want me to mention the parliamentary portal uh, that we want to uh, develop, which is a, a way of giving members access to the information, the parliamentary information that you personally uh, need, so things that are related to you um, and information presented in a, in a sort of a single portal, so you're not having to dive into different systems all over the place to get it. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, wayfinding around the building as another example, um, so uh, capacity to use this new network to make it easier for visitors and uh, people in the building to find uh, various places and the like. You might have noticed some QR codes that have gone up on around some of the artefacts in the in the um, uh, in the fountain court and the uh, in, so basically find it make it easier for people to engage with the building and find out about the, the history and the, I, 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 just, I, I just make the point that um, and the analogy I would use is internet banking right and the the way that the banks have have transferred everyone over to app based applications and how much easier it is mm. and for a member who's racing around the building or might quickly need access to information in the chamber via their phone, mm. an app whereby I want, I want to see the running record, I want to see which amendments are up, mm. I want to know what's on for dinner at the members, it's all there at the top. Now, if, if there are clever people who know how to design these things, mm. rather than sort of relying on pulling out a laptop and trying to, I, I mean, I just think it's worth the investment because it's a lot more productive for members and staff, I, would be my point. Um, so that so that's okay. So you've given us an outline of the capital works and digital transformation. Um, the, what about minor works planned over the next financial year? Of, uh, so we go through a process uh, towards the end of the financial year to determine how to spend the minor works uh, budget in the, in the next year. Just going off what we've been spending this year, one of the things that minor works has to cover, um, which is not. Uh, I know uh, th this is in the LA, so we, I won't talk about it more here, but we do have to cover electorate office uh, uh, refurbishment as part of that. Um, the, uh, we've been doing, you might have seen us doing the ceiling uh, work. That's one of the other major projects that will continue into next year. Um, where uh, where um, corporate accommodation that sits under the ceiling work, both in members' offices and in the corporate area, was required, we also have been using the minor uh, works for that. But we haven't been through the process of allocating next year's minor works yet. We tend to not do it until we've got a better sense of what's coming up in the budget uh, uh, because if certain things are being covered by other budget bids and we look like we're going to get the money, then we can divert the minor works to other areas. And while a thought occurs to me, Mr Webb, last year I think you told us about the... the so there's, the, there's this... I mean, there's the remedial works just to get it up to scratch from a WHS point of view. Then there's the want to have sort of things for productivity and all the rest. But then there's the, the whole problem around space per se and being able to accommodate the growing number of, um, of people in the building. Mm -hmm. is, 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 they, is there going to be a time where we're going to ha actually have to look at new accommodation or expanding the current accommodation? What's the projections on that? 
talk to that a little bit? Um, so we, we've done a, a fair bit of work on that. Uh, there's currently a temporary, um, if you like, surge in um, people in my department because we've got a whole bunch of people in working on those major uh, projects. So we know that that's a possibility at any given time that you might need to accommodate a bunch of people to do particular pieces of work. In the long term, though, both um, uh, all of the parliamentary departments are are reporting areas where they're under resourced, so having capacity to accommodate more people there. On the member side of things, the analysis we've done would indicate that it's probably unlikely that the number of members per se would uh, change dramatically into the foreseeable future. But the the issue that would cause a major um, accommodation concern would be if the staffing allocation uh, to members was to change dramatically. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, if that was to uh, occur, for instance, if all LC members were to get two staffers rather than one, as we should, our capacity to accommodate that, uh, just because of the nature of the tower block and how the offices. I mean, if you've ever, uh, Miss Boyd's uh, uh, not here at the moment, but if you go into the area where the crossbench is, we've we've got quite um, interesting combinations of offices to try and accommodate the two staff yeah. uh, uh, per. A person, if every single LC member was to move in that direction. So the issues that we're dealing with um, are more about the staffing complement for members as opposed to the number of, of members. One of the questions I asked a year or so ago is, you know, could there be, like, is there any prospect there could be 50 members of the Legislative Council or, or 120 members of the Legislative Assembly? That doesn't seem likely, but the staffing allocation is the area that we're probably doing most of our scenario planning on at the moment. If I can just make two observations in relation to this issue. Um, um, during my um, time here, um, there have been periods where um, some staff have been located off-site, uh, particularly um, Legislative Council Committee staff, you know, way back when I first started and then a period about mid midway. Um, and I've got to say it's not ideal. So um, my preference would always be to be able to accommodate everyone on site, if at all possible. Um, the second observation is that we may well face this issue, though, in relation to another temporary surge area in the months to come. As you know, um, in the lead into each election period, uh, for a nine-month period, we appoint the Parliamentary Budget Officer. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer, you know, by the time of the election, has quite a team. We just don't have anywhere to accommodate them at the moment with the surge in um, the capital works, um, the staff who are required to manage the capital works projects and digital transformation. And so that's why one of the things we've been working on, um, which is work that started in uh, uh, Mr Harwin's uh, time, is a precinct plan to try and like look holistically at the mm. building and try and work out what the future uh, might look at, look like, um, uh, to try and work out how we might accommodate some of those uh, things. Uh, I, should, I should say, to, just in the interest of transparency, that we also have had to recently accommodate uh, some extra ministers' uh, suites as well, which has used up uh, some space in the, in the tower block that we might have had some capacity with before. So, um, uh, Maybe you'll have to revisit Max Willis's plans to grab the Nightingale building. I'm glad you mentioned that, yes. Carl, because um, as part of the Macquarie East precinct planning, we we have been looking at options, and indeed uh, the government's preference for a lovely... I was just saying that tongue-in-cheek, but... Lovely yeah. external... What, what is the Maxwell's plan? Um, uh, sort of sitting out, out there in front of the, the hospital area, um, moving and over Hospital Road and creating more of a central public space, um, one of the options that we have considered is the idea of a new entrance to Parliament to enable uh, a facilitation of people through that area which would open up potentially some more space for um, sort of accommodation like committee rooms and the like which is also in short supply but integrating that into level seven so that would require taking a little bit of the hospital next door but uh, the Nightingale building well that's always been a point of contention and we did look at the prospect as well of trying to bring the ministry back into the precinct, uh, the parliamentary precinct, uh, and looked at options there in terms of what that would mean to the current building. And uh, 
there were some significant issues there, and obviously that's a, an issue for the executive nonetheless. <laughs> um, all right. The bicentenary celebrations, you did touch on this, but um, uh, have we got a dollar figure on what we need? It's 2024, isn't it? We've got to get it all up to speed by. Yes. So can, yes. You, can you just give us briefly, if you could, President, because I want to try and get through, um, what sort of money do we need to get it up to standard? What we've, what we've done in that regard is... Uh, point don't... of order, you're talking about the capital works cost. Yes. Uh, not that cost of the, uh, any... No, no, the capital works cost, I'm sorry. Yes, I should have been just be specific, yeah. Thank, thank you. And uh, that's, that's what I was going to address, the capital works. We're, we're, we're really, what we've done yeah. is tried to, tried to address the, the issue of, of insufficient funding to remediate uh, the, the urgent works needed in the RUM hospital. Uh, for all the reasons I've explained, and package that up with the bicentenary budget bid, which obviously has gone uh, in or is going into um, to Treasury and through that budget processes, uh, in order to prioritise that as a must-do over the next couple of years, so that when we come to 2024 and we have all the uh, planned uh, functions, as well as the, the, uh, the end of year in November, the CPA International Conference, we have a building that uh, the Parliament and the State can be uh, a lot uh, prouder of and uh, we'll put the best foot forward and deal with some of these issues that are, are really uh, undermining and degrading the building and making uh, really working in the building unsafe in some areas. So as I mentioned, uh, the occupational health and safety issues in parts of the Rum Hospital are becoming intolerable for some members in terms of being able to work in those spaces for lengthy periods of time. And uh, we have uh, the, the second floor balcony we, is off, gut, off limits. So, President, that $188 million, is that is that part of this two-year funding envelope for the...? Well, that $188 million reflects what's been a deficit over the last 20 years, but we're looking at a smaller, much smaller portion of that in relation to the bid that's been put in. In that regard, yes, it's in the vicinity of $20 million is what we're looking for uh, the capital side uh, in order to address all the issues. At 23, 23 and 24, is it, to get up to speed? Yes, to get up to speed. And, and part of that will be uh, a new air conditioning system, for example, to do with the humidity, humidity issues, which <laughs> are creating all the moisture. Yep. Um, and you might, see, you might have seen walking past the parks room how that's been stripped back and, uh, and, and to reveal some of the, the actual uh, utilities and, you'll, and uh, it, you'll see that there's problems with the sprinklers and the, the air conditioning system which comes up through the roof. We want to reposition that and also the void that exists in that corner of the parks room where quite a lot of mould and other material um, comes, comes forth, uh, not to mention the, the flooring being uneven and the likes. There's quite a significant piece of work in the parks room that leads into the, the adjacent rooms, as well as the chambers where uh, we, we want to address uh, the mould issues, of course, but also there's wall, wallpaper issues and, and just maintenance issues in there that haven't been properly addressed. President, can I, I'll, I'll just wind up this bracket with a, with a couple of questions on the um, proposed uh, expansion, <coughs> marketisation, viability of the cafe oh. uh, on level seven. I just want to get the wind up on that because um, the original proposition was to have some opaque, uh, controllable glass doors, wasn't it? And you would open up that area where the fountain is, you know, where the exhibition is to people to sit outside. And then I think there was a proposition to can the opaque automatic control and just have glass doors and then it was canned altogether. Can you just give us a feel of the... What did it cost to do the preparatory works for that? And was there a cost-benefit analysis done on why don't we just see this through and why was it decided not to go ahead with it? I mean, I, and I, I want to be frank, I mean, superficially, I thought it wasn't a bad idea to open that place up because it's sort of squirrelled away, doesn't seem to get a lot of use, particularly by the public, and I thought it would have been a good income source for the parliament to make use of what would be a nice cafe area for the public to enjoy as well as members. But I just wanted you to sort of give us a bit of a feel on the decision-making and the cost-benefit analysis behind okay. 
termination of that yeah. project. Okay. I have to, I, I can indicate that um, my uh, first question is related to this issue. So if that's the end, um, uh, or the last of this bracket, uh, Mr Chair, it might be a convenient time for me to ask. Yes, absolutely. Something. Thank you. But I think mine are quite different to that, from a very different perspective. And in terms of the President's answer? Yeah, look, um, it, it is an issue that preceded me uh, in relation to the original decision so far as putting a door in that space, which, as you know, was going to be uh, uh, an exercise, a door being, I think, built uh, uh, in San Francisco, um, and we couldn't get uh, a proper uh, outcome after four attempts to create the door. The system would work properly in terms of moving it from clear to opaque. So the decision was revisited for the whole project when I became president. And uh, in that regard, um, it's probably fair to say that, that I have probably a high degree of sensitivity in relation to the impact of, of that on the exhibition space in the Fountain Court area and the original her heritage proposals uh, that were endorsed and, and complemented by the, the architects that, that actually built the Fountain Court and the Heritage Plan of Parliament. Uh, and, the, and the idea of putting a door in that place uh, impinges on the exhibition space quite significantly. And as part of that door proposal, uh, the, the next step was to put tables and chairs in that area, uh, which would um, affect the egress and movement of uh, particularly legislative council members to and from the chamber um, and limit uh, the use of that space and, and also impact upon the viewing of that exhibition space. So there are very specific um, requirements for how that space is used uh, and on, on balance when we needed to review that decision uh, I took a view at odds uh, with with some that we really needed to put a halt on the project and uh, and that it was not sensitive to the original um, purpose of uh, the fountain court uh, and didn't take into a number of those factors in the way that that I believe they should have been balanced. And can, I, can I ask President what it cost us to get to the point where we stopped and then what it would have cost us had we followed through? I think uh, the cost for the whole project was a vicinity of $65,000 from memory. I think we'd actually formed up the work for the door to go in, which cost us in the vicinity of 20000 was About it? About $35,000. $35,000. Okay, so there was... Uh, then the, the final element, the difference between those figures would be putting, uh, paying for the door and putting it in. So that was stopped at that point in time. And the, the view that was taken was that uh, we could actually bring attention to the um, cafe with better wayfinding, better signage, uh, which is part of the proposal for the front of house, uh, which, is going, which is going through a process now of, of uh, architectural um, drawings and the like mm -hmm. to give options, which will be something that... Uh, uh, the presiding officers will need to consult on in the near future in order to work out the best way of implementing that proposal. And so of the 65, we dropped 35, and the remaining 30 was would have got us to the, got there. Um, was there any... What was the process to, to socialise this with members? Because my, my feeling was not a, lot, not a lot of members knew what the proposition was. Yes, well, um, in, indeed, when I became president, I wasn't aware that we were doing this at all, uh, and uh, I was concerned. Um, I was concerned about it uh, when I, it did come to my attention, but it had been a decision uh, that had been made by the previous presiding officers and executive team, and, and I was uh, advised I was naturally bound to to reflect that and continue that process. Until there'd been um, a change in in the scheme, change in the project of such a fundamental nature, it, it could be revisited, and and a, a judgment that, that I made on on speaking to various members, on reflecting on the heritage plan for Parliament, and seeking advice in that regard, and the original architectural motivations behind the Fountain Court, and the implications that had not been taken into account, of uh, the egress uh, of members to and from the chamber by positioning of chairs and tables the Fountain Court area, which 
uh, was a significant add-on from the original vision. So the view that I took as presiding officer after consulting with various members, um, and th these, this is not a perfect sort of situation, but uh, um, it's my responsibility to make a judgment uh, and make a decision in that regard. And after seeking some counsel and some advice in relation to those heritage and architectural aspects and the, the original purpose of that room, uh, the view I took was that we needed to put that project on hold. In fact, I would prefer that we restored things to as they were uh, while still having the, the ability um, or the, the original works embedded in the, the wall. So if there's a decision in the future to move to putting in um, some sort of uh, doorway into that area, then that could be done and that $35,000 that has been used to date would not be wasted. So that, that would always be a possibility for the future. Um, but at this point in time, in, in my judgment... Well, can I suggest, President, that, that that's good that you've said that because the $35,000 hasn't been wasted. In that's other right. Words. There's the structural preparation there. Uh, can I suggest that that's a conversation that really should be socialised with the members because I don't think the majority of members were even aware. But I don't want to dwell on the point because we've got a lot to get through. So... Maybe yes. But I will say on that point... Well, I'd like to dwell on it. If I could, I, I am... When I said... I, the, I front of house, the front of house project, which is coming to a stage where I think it's, it's ready for some socialisation to take your turn, um, I think it, it's integrated into that effectively because all those things impact on the fountain court. So I'm quite happy to have a, a discussion and revisit it. But uh, I thought in the interests of... of uh, you know, ensuring that, that uh, there was no further steps taken which would impact upon the, the very important exhibition space that there needed to be a hold on that project until we had the whole vision for the fountain court and the front of house very clear in people's minds. Before Don takes over, can I just ask, when is the formwork uh, going to be removed? Well, that, that is a decision that is still being progressed and uh, that formwork, I would hope, uh, it requires both presiding officers to agree, but that's still under discussion. Um, but in the meantime, um, we are where we are. Um, uh, just before I ask my question, could you just clarify what the front of house um, pro project is? Okay. The, the front of house project uh, is, is again something that has been put uh, in play by the presiding officers before my my appointment, my election, that it, it is uh, looking at how we deal with um, the arrival of visitors and members to Parliament when they walk through into the reception area, a redevelopment of the reception area so that uh, we look at uh, a few of the options of perhaps moving the, the front desk um, more onto into the fountain court um, and dealing with the, re, the current uh, desk area and, uh, which has some issues with egress into the Legislative Assembly area, but, uh, putting in uh, some display cases, putting in uh, a few options in relation to um, some of the cabinets that are currently in the, the, um, the, the, the bar or the, the, the cafe area on level seven for um, parliamentary tokens and the like and things that could be purchased um, through the, uh, the cafe area, moving those and putting them into more of a presentational piece in the actual foyer where the current uh, um, desk is for reception. So reconfiguring that area to ensure that uh, it's more receptive and more and, and updated. So there are some proposals that have been, or options that have been developed in that regard, which are at that sort of early stage, which need to be, I think, consulted with to ensure that we get the, the best possible results. And I'm very keen to do that in the near future. Well, first of all, President, I'd like to endorse what you uh, go to this, uh, in what can only be described as verisimilitude um, are being able to do in terms of the, the door from the public cafe into the, I'll go back to the, staff. Uh, into the fountain court. Uh, uh, and I have to say that uh, my response to what your, 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 the answer you've just given is nothing other than alarm. Uh, but in any case, uh, I, I, Mr. President, with your uh, permission, I'm just going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Webb a few questions about um, 
uh, in relation to this. Yeah. Uh, Mr Webb, um, Parliament House is a state heritage listed building, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, and a heritage conservation management plan has been prepared in terms of the various precincts um, of uh, uh, the building and they're given um, uh, ratings, as I recall, uh, of high, medium and low. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that uh, heritage management uh, report, a uh, heritage conservation management report at the time was uh, lodged with the Heritage Council of New South Wales. Correct. Mr. Uh, Webb, in the um, in the uh, heritage uh, in that conservation management plan, what is the rating for the Fountain Court? Fountain Court is uh, is a highly rated uh, heritage uh, section of the of mm -hmm. the um, Parliament. Um, was the uh, 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 was the heritage management plan um, uh, a fact or taken into account? decisions were made about um, punching a hole in the wall of the Fountain Court between the uh, public cafe and yep. the Fountain Court. Yes, so um, uh, we went through the normal heritage process for a high, highly significant heritage area, uh, so a Section 60 heritage application. We also consulted with the architect, um, Andrew Anderson, and briefed him on the proposal uh, as well. And went through that uh, went through that process because of the high heritage nature of the. Uh, who was involved in preparing? Uh, if, uh, from the point of view of staff, and any contractors involved, including um, heritage specialists, architects, mm. etc. Who was involved mm. uh, in uh, taking decisions in relating relation to um, that uh, proposal to punch a hole through the wall of the Fountain Court? Um, so the Capital Works team prepared the heritage uh, uh, application. I'll uh, have to ask them to send through the name of the heritage architect that we used through that period. I don't have that. So you're taking that on notice? I'll take that on notice, if the, but if they can provide it to me. Would you also provide on notice the extract from the conservation? I'm sorry, uh, I'll, ref I'll withdraw that. Is the heritage, I haven't looked recently, is the conservation management plan on um, the website? Uh, yes, I believe so. Oh, it's LSJ Architecture was the firm, architecture firm. Um, yeah, I believe so. I, we haven't taken it down or anything yeah, like that. Thank you. Uh, I'll reread that section later. Um, the uh, fine LSJ Architects yeah. Yeah, and the Section 60 application uh, was that dealt with by Sydney City Council yes, under delegation from the Heritage correct. Council. That's correct. Yes, uh, and they they gave um, um, uh, permission. They did. Yes. And um, Andrew Anderson didn't have any concerns with the proposal. Uh, was his some um, concurrent sort in writing, or was it done uh, verbally? I will check that. Uh, it was reported back to me, but I'll check whether it was sought in writing. Right. Um, could uh, could you um, please uh, supply um, whatever letters were written to Andrew Anderson's and whatever reply was sought? Yep. Um, are there any other questions that I want to ask? No, I think that covers uh, my questions in that re regard. Um, Mr Chair, would you uh, like me to go on to ask um, the two other matters that I want to cover? or would can, I, can I just ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, I, I, this is just in relation to uh, COVID compliance costing in the uh, Parliament. Um, it's going to be one of mine. You may not be able to answer this off the top of your head, but... For the last financial year and for the financial year to date, what has been the total cost of, or direct costs, I suppose, in relation to compliance with COVID? In other words, testing, kits, staffing, etc., etc., related and unrelated to those when the Parliament's been open. And I suppose as a, as a joiner to that, it's been the cost to the revenue of the parliament in terms of it being closed to the public, for example, as it is today, um, that we are missing out on having the public coming in here and using our restaurants and using our um, cafeterias, etc. I mean, we've gone to a lot of trouble in the last few years promoting all of these things. At some stage, we do need to get back to a normal operation and 
Yeah. Uh, doing things again properly. I, as a completely as an aside, and this is another question today. And I, since I got the email from Mark, I'll ask you the question, Mark. Why did we need to shut the parliament down today? Uh, because there's a protest outside. I mean, what's different today to what it was yesterday or Monday, for example? Uh, you want to talk about oh, there's there's a whole lot of questions there, so you want to start from the start? And we'll yeah, yep. start, start from the start, start, yes. So just, just as a uh, general may, comment. May I yeah. ask, Mr Chair, if as part of the scope of your question, you also specify uh, what has been paid to um, the consultancy firm Gibbs in uh, the preceding final financial year and so far in this financial year. We, we have, we have there, there are excellent questions. We have the information. I'll pass to Mr Webb shortly for those specific details, but uh, I just make the point that uh, uh, they are significant costs and the significant cost to Parliament being closed as well, particularly in our catering functions area. Um, but uh, obviously that was done in relation to uh, response to the health advice and on the basis of of the health advice given by Hibs, and in, and in that regard, it's probably worthwhile running through the figures if you'd like to do that, Mr. Webb. Uh, yes, uh, we'll do that. So um, uh, this year, until the end of January uh, 2022, uh, the COVID uh, costs to the Parliament have been $2.25 million. Um, uh, we've also, as you say, experienced uh, a loss of revenue uh, in the catering uh, area, which uh, the loss to date has been $2.24 million uh, dollars worth of That's loss That's this, revenue, financial, this year. financial year. That's a big dollar. It's huge. Dollar miss out. Uh, absolutely huge. We had, um, the year before COVID came, we had got catering to a break-even uh, point, mm. so uh, mm. first parliament in Australia to do so. So um, the breakdown of the COVID costs, um, we did have some additional cleaning uh, costs that came in. That was about 84000 Dollars, um, the rapid antigen test uh, kits that we've uh, bought is uh, about five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred and twenty-five thousand um, dollars. The nurses uh, that we've had in administering uh, the testing regime has been one point two million dollars. Um, we've had various uh, IT and and audiovisual uh, costs as we've moved to try and um, uh, uh, support virtual committees and virtual running of uh, uh, chambers and the rest, that's about $300,000. Uh, and to the um, uh, Hibs uh, costs, which was the uh, nature of uh, Mr Harwin's question as well, uh, this year, uh, year to date, we spent $68,000 on that advice. Last year, we spent $88,000 on that advice, which were the two pieces of information uh, that was uh, provided, uh, that was asked uh, for there. Um, uh, as you say, on the catering side of things, that loss of revenue is made up of uh, functions and events. Of course, they dried up uh, completely. We didn't have any um, functions and events uh, for many months of this financial year. Uh, it also uh, catering uh, revenue around the restaurant uh, and uh, even things like the cafe, uh, for instance, uh, with the sitting, the period of time where sittings didn't happen, for instance, the, you know, that's usually the busiest time with things like cafe, uh, quorum and the like. Uh, so it's a mixture of uh, events, functions, restaurant and uh, cafe revenue, which contributed to that, uh, that loss of revenue. It has had a significant uh, impact on uh, the parliament's financial uh, position. We do have a... Um, uh, what they call a parameter and technical adjustment bid in with Treasury to uh, try to recoup some of those costs and we've been working with our insurer uh, around some of the catering uh, losses as well to see to what extent those catering losses would be covered by uh, the insurer uh, as well. Um, and so, so we're, uh, we're working through those processes at the moment. Um, we have... Um, uh, we have put a very rigorous process in place to ensure that the COVID costs that we are tracking are only related to the COVID uh, uh, crisis. Uh, I did see some commentary uh, over the weekend about other, uh, about government departments where that might not have been the case. I can assure the committee that we have had a rigorous You don't process. have a COVID slash fund then? No, uh, sadly uh, not. Uh, 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 everything that is in that COVID bid is related to costs that we would not have incurred except for the COVID uh, situation. Um, uh, so yes, that's, that's a breakdown of where we're, where we're at at the moment. 
uh, it, it is. Um, it has had a big impact on our uh, operations. As we broke even with catering, for instance, it enabled us to start to consider um, how to provide better service to member through, members through the catering uh, uh, system. Suddenly, when you're losing two million plus uh, dollars, uh, that you know, puts more pressure back on the catering uh, area. Um, uh, we did some great work through that time. I think you're all aware of the Meals for Disadvantaged People program that we did in conjunction with Oz Harvest. So we, we kept people busy and I think we did some good work, uh, but it can't be denied the financial impact was, was very, very large. While we're talking about ca catering, and I just mentioned it to the President, I did mention it to him before, um, and it's a very small thing, probably a silly thing in some people's mind, but um, I sat in on the uh, SC1 uh, hearing in relation to the our good people from Treasury on Monday, and uh, as everyone that sits into any of our committee work in this uh, in this place, certainly since 2019, when the uh, then Secretary of the Treasury uh, slashed uh, any expenditure in relation to our uh, morning teas and even cups of tea, even a, even a lousy little biscuit, I note that uh, for the record that the Treasury staff, when they turned up uh, on Monday, had copious amounts of food, copious amounts of drink copious amounts of absolutely everything they needed uh, and they sat privately and quietly having their morning teas and lunches and afternoon teas uh, in the in the parks room opposite the Jubilee room. Um, there's obviously a two-tiered society going on here. I mean, I thought the members of parliament employed these people. These are the very same people who slashed our scones and... You have a question, Mr. President, or is it... The question is coming. The question's coming. The question is, uh, at what stage will the parliament properly be considered in relation to reasonable catering requirements? Having a 15-minute midi break uh, and then having to run upstairs, grab a cup of tea and come downstairs is fine. I just think that everybody should be treated equal. Do you agree? There's a question. Okay, well, that's... Uh, he agrees. Um, look, and, as uh, I in understand that light, it, I note it's 10.58, so we'll probably be breaking one. And, and I have a surprise for you, um, Mr We're having Chair. a break, aren't we? Uh, well, the, I, I, I 11 o'clock. Following, following well, uh, receiving... The break, the break will be based on whether... Um, We're going to get scones. Go <laughs> right, I get the right answer. <laughs> following uh, receiving a number <laughs> of so complaints well along, well along these lines, I, I asked the question uh, as to why the policy was changed and, and the... Uh, the answer was that uh, it was an efficiency dividend um, uh, sort of saving that was identified um, probably a couple of years ago now and was implemented as a result. Uh, and look, um, I think it's an issue that would be best put on the, the chair, uh, the committee of chairs to, to discuss. Um, but personally, given the long sitting hours for the budget sittings, um, I've decided that uh, we, we could accommodate that through uh, the sittings for the budget estimates and I've asked for that to be reinstituted for the budget estimates uh, so that members are given uh, a morning tea and afternoon tea um, in the committee hearing. Uh, a modest a modest morning tea, uh, perhaps not I'm as... I'm not asking for anything uh, at all, I'm simply saying that... Uh, and in uh, fact, the, 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 the just venting at Treasury. In fact, the morning tea. <laughs> I'm just having a go at Treasury. I'm That's informed by the clerk the morning tea is on its uh, way. It it be, there's obviously two classes simply, of people working for in and around the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, it'll be simply some tea and coffee, some fresh fruit, and some modest biscuits. Uh, but I thought that was appropriate given the representations that have been made to me and my my clear understanding of the long hours being worked during estimates uh, across the day. So. I've taken the initiative to reinstate that, but wish to refer the matter to our chair's committee. That's so a that very brave uh, position. We can uh, sort that out moving forward, but I think it's a very modest cost, and I think it uh, is reflective of the, uh, the the long hours being spent by members that we can accommodate that. And it's eleven. Just for the record, I'm perfectly happy to go and bark take away from that from the cafeteria and support and support the parliament's turnover. Anyway, well, we'll be um, supporting Mr. It Chair, I was. Um, for the record, I did for the make record. the uh, uh, the point that in uh, all of the other estimates, uh, we we had have been taking a break at eleven o'clock, and I think it would be appropriate to give the staff a rest uh, and um, also enable ministers uh, members to <coughs> under undertake um, whatever urgent things they need to do for fifteen minutes.
Sorry, what was that? Every other estimates we'd it's had. For. Well, I, I haven't no, talked about one recently. Had Maybe it's because break. it's me. Maybe What's that's a break what for 15 minutes? Had a break for 15 minutes, right, before we resume and conclude the hearing. You need so a that hit. staff can take a break and that if members have to go and attend tend to urgent matters, they're able to do so. Spoken like a true unionist, I agree. Well, I was going to suggest that we have a break in that, at, from 11 o'clock, and it's now 11 o'clock. We'll have a break for 15 minutes and return. Good Thank suggestion. You very much, Chair. I like that suggestion. Thank you very uh, much. I, I trust Thank that you. we might see a much appreciate. tea and coffee appear shortly. Okay. He will be here soon. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask some questions with regards to uh, closed captioning and employment levels. But first, um, I may, uh, through you, Mr. President, to Mr. Mark Webb, um, some questions about um, the uh, closed captioning services. Um, in the last budget uh, estimates, uh, Mr. Webb uh, said that DPS was finalising contracts for closed captioning services. Um, and that the technology would be uh, trialled in December on some committees. Are you able to confirm if that took place, Mr Webb? Uh, yes, yes I can. Uh, yes, that happened. We concluded the project um, and uh, we have been testing both in December and uh, later January and through into February um, uh, with uh, committees and in the chambers as well. Um, I'm pleased to say that that Testing has gone well, and the intent is to start the service up in March. March. Uh, so what were the outcomes of the trials? I mean, uh, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, the, there was um, the normal kind of just making sure that the technology all talked to each other and the, and the like. Um, we were also wanting to assess the uh, quality of the, of the captions. So um, Parliament is a unique uh, environment, and we wanted to make sure that the captioning process actually... Uh, usefully captured what was happening in, in Parliament and that meant working with the with the people that we've taken on to make sure that they got across parliamentary language, uh, understood the procedures that were happening and so they could anticipate things that would be coming up etc. So that, all of that's been happening over the last couple of so When do you anticipate the um, it will be introduced into Parliament? In, in March. In March. In, in this year, yes. This year. <laughs> yes, oh, yes okay. indeed, yes. Well, that's, that's fantastic. That's, uh, that's good news. Uh, however, a uh, question with regards to staffing. Um, will that uh, closed captioning have any impact on Hansard? Uh, so the, um, the transcript that comes out of the closed captioning also gets fed through to Hansard so they can use it as uh, the first rough cut of a, of a transcript. Um, the Hansard team are working with that uh, information to see how useful uh, that is at the moment. There are no impacts on staffing levels or the rest at the, at the moment, but it uh, uh, has the potential to increase the, the speed with which we can produce uh, uh, transcripts. When you say that there's no impact on staffing at the moment... Uh, well, no, sorry, no, no, I'm not foreseeing any impact on you staffing. You don't foresee any impact. Uh, can I just take you to um, a few questions with regards to matters of disability that um, uh, the, um, for the, pre uh, the member Abigail Boyd uh, started asking and the president uh, made some, gave some uh, answers. Um, in terms of our employment levels of people with disabilities, are you able to provide us with numbers on those rates of employment from financial year 2019 until the present? And you can take that on notice. I might need to take that on notice. Um, okay. Um, is there a proactive uh, recruitment policy for people with disabilities, or is it happening uh, organically? Do you have a, uh, you yes. have a policy, Sorry. Mr. President? Or uh, so uh, yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things we've been working on uh, recently, you might recall, the former president was the former minister for disability, and he yeah. kicked off a process of creating a disability um, uh, inclusion action plan for the parliament, which is a, a, a process that many uh, government departments follow as well. Um, in fact, this is timely because just last week the SMG, uh, myself and the two clerks, uh, approved the first disability inclusion uh, action plan and that gives structure to what has pr previously been a slightly less formal uh, approach. So we've always um, included in our advertising, um, uh, you know, our desire to have people from a, a diverse range of backgrounds apply for jobs, etc. The disability inclusion plan looks at employment, it looks at the building and uh, accessibility in the building, all, all 
things that could contribute to people with disability being able to fully participate both in employment in the parliament and in the parliamentary processes as well. Is that well. planned on, uh, on the website? Uh, it, public? it will be soon. Well, I think we literally yep. approved yes. it on Friday last week. Oh. So it's uh, it's uh, very, very close. If not already, it will be close. It will be very soon available for people to look at. Okay. Um, how many members of staff who work in, in the parliament uh, in senior management identify as having a disability? Uh, I will ask my crack team to send me through the figure uh, while we're talking and uh, jump back in uh, with it when it comes through. Um, in terms of accessibility uh, to visitors, um, is the disability inclusion plan include also not just the staff and members of parliament, does that include uh, accessibility to visitors yeah. into the building? Absolutely, yes. Um, and most recently, uh, and that's an ongoing uh, uh, program for us, as you know, with a uh, heritage building, there can be constraints uh, when you look at the tension between accessibility um, uh, and heritage and, uh, and cost and the like. Uh, most recently, we have uh, replaced the drive system in the elevator that goes from level six to level seven, that is the pathway that people in a wheelchair use to get into the parliament. It was previously often colloquially described as the world's slowest uh, yeah. elevator. It was not uh, not the not the fastest. Uh, and uh, Mr. Harwin will recall that one of my first questions when I came on board is, "Couldn't this elevator go any faster?" And to which, at the time, the answer was no. Uh, but uh, and this was news to me. But elevator technology has been improving uh, over the years. And um, I'm pleased to say, over Christmas, we were able to. Um, uh, replace the drive system of the elevator such that a journey that used to take a minute now takes 25 seconds. And part of the reasoning for that investment was to make sure that people that are coming in in a wheelchair can rapidly get to level seven. Whereas previously, you know, if the if the elevator had been on level nine, by the time it got down to level six to pick somebody up and then back up, you know, minutes and minutes uh, will have passed. So that's just an example, I guess, of. Uh, the improvements to accessibility. Um, you also would note that the Speaker's Garden and the Hospital Road uh, uh, areas both now have uh, accessible ramps uh, so that people can get into the uh, into the building. Um, the turnstiles that were put in uh, on uh, at the back at Hospital Road also have an accessible entrance uh, in the middle of the two uh, turnstiles. Um, so we are, as we move around the building and as funding allows, we've been ensuring that accessible uh, access to the building is top of our uh, of our concerns whenever we touch an area of the building. Does it, does it address, uh, does the uh, disability accessible accessibility plan address level nine, for example, if, if visitors yeah. wanted to go onto to onto level nine? Garden. So at the moment, as as you would know, the pathway for a visitor in um, in a wheelchair to get to level nine is through the formerly world's slowest elevator that I referred to before. And, and of, so one of our immediate things was to improve the speed to make that a, not just the accessibility to level seven, but also up to level nine better. Um, I have uh, asked for some engineering studies to be done on what it would take to uh, look at uh, the accessibility of the set of stairs that comes up from the level nine lift uh, lobby up into the uh, garden and to see what options might be available there. It's a tricky area because it's the boundary between the tower block building and the fountain court building. So from an engineering point of view, it's not as straightforward as it might seem um, uh, at first glance, uh, but we're doing some preliminary works. The cost of it will require us to put a budget bid in, though it's not something that we'd be able to incorporate in minor uh, works, I don't think. Uh, is but there, is there a time frame? Uh, the, uh, the engineering works will happen over the next couple of months. The uh, Whether we get money to do it will depend on, on how, how budget is made uh, available to us. The other the other matter relates to... Um, I think uh, Mr Blunt was... Yep. Would like to say. Blunt, yep. If I can just refer to an initiative of... Um, it's probably a few years old now, but an initiative of which the former presiding officers were extremely proud was the uh, construction of the Changing Places facility. It's one of the few such facilities anywhere in the Sydney CBD, I understand, That's correct. Uh, that enables um, an adult um, who requires changing to be uh, changed in a dignified, uh, in a dignified manner. With regards to access to the gym, um, also for uh, disabled people, people with disabilities, um, does the plan also address that? 
yeah, uh, yes, we do have gym access on our list. I, I would say that of the accessibility um, uh, projects that we're considering, it's probably a little lower on the list than some of the other ones that we've been uh, talking about. But it is, it has been captured as a part of our review of the precinct to see where accessibility needs to be improved. When you say lower, is it next year or the year after? Uh, it, it would depend on funding. Uh, and, but I haven't even done the engineering works uh, down there uh, yet, so I, I couldn't say one way or the other. But uh, it is certainly captured on the list of things that need improving. Um, but uh, it's not just as simple as, say, a ramp down into the gym because the bathrooms down there are not accessible uh, compliant as well. So you're talking about having to look at uh, a ramp of some kind uh, or something that would enable a person in a wheelchair to get into yes. the gym. Yeah. And you'd also have to look at the complete refurbishment of the bathrooms because at the moment they're, they're not accessible uh, compliant. You, if, if you recall going into, say, the men's bathroom, you go in through a door and then you have to do a tight turn to the right. And so even getting in... Uh, to the bathroom is a difficult for someone in a, in a wheelchair. Um, and then beyond that, you'd have to then look at then the actual gym floor itself, uh, the spacing of the equipment, what type of equipment is there and all the rest. So it's not a small uh, yeah. undertaking at, at all. I understand that. Sorry, Don? No, no, it's all right. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask a question, sorry? Yeah, go. Jack, uh, before I'll break earlier on, uh, Mr. President, what about the mould in the, in the building or certain parts of the building? Right. How how's that actually been addressed with the air conditioning system? The other thing I'd like to know is, does our air conditioning system also get tested for Legionnaires' disease? And, and how often that, yes. that occurred? Uh, yes, so we uh, we have a regular maintenance uh, regime around the air conditioning system and tests for things like Legionnaires' disease, disease is a part of that annual uh, process that we go through. Um, it's uh, Legionnaires' disease. Uh, someone will correct me if I'm uh, if I'm uh, wrong, but um, uh, I think it's twice a year that we check for Legionnaires' disease, but I'll get someone to uh, confirm that in case I've got that wrong. Um, uh, the HVAC system that controls the air conditioning is 45 years old. Um, some of the air conditioning that was put into the two chambers is a bit newer than that, uh, in fact, a lot newer than that. Um, and just to give you an example, so you might recall that at the moment we are... Um, running 100% fresh air into the chambers with the changeover of eight times an hour through sittings in order to, as a COVID preventative uh, measure. I asked my engineering team what would happen if I switched the whole building over to do fresh air changing every eight hours and they said the system would burn out within three months if I was to try uh, that. So it is an old uh, system. It is scrupulously maintained, but uh, uh, when we talk about the underlying infrastructure of the building and uh, and uh, making sure that uh, it's fit for purpose for the next uh, 200 years. Uh, they're the kind of things that you don't see on a day-to-day -day basis, but are absolutely vital uh, to be done in order to make sure that the, uh, uh, the precinct can continue the work in the way that it, that it does. And um, Mr. Musselmane, uh, approximately 2% of the LC and DPS staff have a disability. 2%. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, yes, President, um, I just want to take you to some issues to do with um, <clears throat> staffing um, and positions and whatnot. We've been over this ground before, but I think it's pertinent to raise it given what we experienced um, on the last estimates. Um, by way of introduction, um, we agreed that there had to be a, an urgent review into staff grading and positions. and that was in light of several anomalies we raised with regards to uh, remuneration, relief and whatnot. Can we get a, get a feel for where it's up to, the review? Absolutely, and, and I think that came initially out of uh, my, the former presiding officers um, answering a question of yours, Mr Buttigieg, and uh, in that regard I can report that uh, Ms Edwards, Kelly Edwards, has been appointed as... Uh, independent person to oversight uh, that review um, and uh, the, the consultation with the PSA has commenced back in December um, and in February um, we appointed uh, the independent expert, Kelly Edwards. Uh, so can I, so just, sorry President, I don't mean to be rude, but just while things occur to me, so this is the, the industrial relations consultant, is it? The, yes. And, and what's her background? Where's she from? 
Well, she, you've got yep. the background. Um, so she's a barrister at Demnan Chambers. She has uh, served on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and NCAT uh, in yep. the past. Um, uh, we went out to three uh, different people with uh, uh, specialised in this area, and, and Miss Edwards uh, came back with a proposal that we thought was uh, good. I think previously you, you'd indicated, and, and certainly the other message we got is that bringing some independent external um, capacity in was an important part of the process. Okay. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that has uh, commenced. Okay. Um, can I also, when you say PSA, um, what about the United Services Union? I understand they've got some coverage too. Have they been consulted? Uh, the Media Arts Alliance has uh, yeah. some coverage, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I don't. I'd suggest the United Services Union has as well, with staff. Uh, I will check that. I've not yeah. seen. I think you'll find they have. Uh, yeah. you know which staff? Uh, I know certainly LC staff, uh, and and there would be LA staff as well. Uh, now we've never. Just to clarify, you're referring to members staff. Correct. Okay. They're not part of the joint consultative committee process at all. Um, if they're not, I would suggest that's a major omission. Okay, I will. Look into that. And I don't mean that in an adversarial sense. No, no, no. It's I just I know that they do have coverage. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so Miss Edwards has been appointed, um, and uh, there was there was to be a, uh, a consultation group comprising of members. Um, is that? Like to interface with that is that yes that's right so uh, as to your previous comments about consultation the intent is to have a consultation group that includes both members and, and staff that would be um, sorry uh, a consultation group that would involve both uh, members uh, and their respective uh, staff uh, to uh, be involved in the consultation around the process okay so members um, staff union so where like Miss Edwards has been appointed, and what's that? Is that it? Is that as far as we? Uh, so we're also looking at um, you know Mercer who do job evaluation. So we'll be engaging Mercer to be involved in once there's an agreed uh, job description in, uh, for the various positions. If you like, uh, Mercer will be involved in the evaluation of that job description to again ensure that it's a completely independent uh, uh, process. Um, uh, of course, this goes beyond the salary for the positions because mm. people have also raised issues around work health and safety, um, uh, fatigue uh, management, uh, uh, conditions of employment uh, more generally, hours worked, etc. So uh, we have kept the scope wide to look at any employment conditions that people are facing, uh, not just narrow it down to just what salary should this job uh, uh, be. So. Um, so the so, Mercer, the Mercer part of the equation will be a, a, a job evaluation on worth, yeah. but then there's those those whole other suite of things, things that, that have to be looked at. As I'm well. just interested to know at what point will the consultation with members and staff and unions be inserted so that we get a fully informed debate prior to any formal job. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the consultation will be through the entire process, not not at uh, some defined point late in the, in the piece. Um, because to come up with the job description, if you like, we have to do that consultation. Like, what do you require out of your staff? Precisely, what yeah. what's the staff do on a day-to-day -day basis? We need to understand the reality of what a 2022 member's staff uh, does in order to <coughs> construct a, a, a job description that can be evaluated. And so the, will that be like, will, um, th will there be a point in time where Mercer is involved in that watching the input so that they can determine the yeah. relative weights and... Yeah, yeah, yeah? Exactly, exactly right. So. Okay, do you have a timeline for that? Uh, it will depend a little bit on the consultation. The process has started uh, now. The uh, intent is to try and make sure that the process is complete such that the annual update to the presiding officer's determination on conditions of employment can be updated, which is uh, it's updated on the 1st of July each year. So the intent is to do the work uh, between now and that update of the... Uh, so we've got four months to pull this together, and correct. but... but but the the actual composition of the consultation group hasn't been no that's uh, where that's the next uh, cab right. off the rank okay uh, okay um, and any 
terms of reference for the review being finalised? Uh, that'll be... Uh, uh, we, uh, we've drafted uh, what we want to get out of it, but the first thing we want to consult with, with the consultation group is yeah. making sure those terms of reference cover what everyone wants to get out of the process. So. Okay. Okay, good. Um, have any rep... I'm, I'm just conscious of the comedy between the houses, but I don't think this is beyond that, given question I'm asking is that have any representations been made to the the lower house speaker, Mr. A, the Honourable Jonathan O'Day, regarding the need to conduct a similar review um, for uh, senior electorate officers and uh, electorate office staff? Certainly, and uh, the speaker is keen to be involved. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, what have we got here? Just trying uh, to make Mr. Sure. Buttigie, just in response to one of your questions from before, the union you mentioned is not a party to our awards, which might be why they've not been involved in some of the um, some of the um, uh, issues that have come up before. So I might, I'm very happy to talk with you offline to try and work through. Yeah, let's have a discussion about that. If they're not a party to the yeah. uh, to any of our awards, yeah, okay. uh, but of course, member staff fall into an interesting category because the the, the, the uh, legislation, yes, and yeah. the, and the um, Presiding officer's determination. So I'm happy to talk to you about. No, that let's offline. do that. That would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, the initial document outlining the review described conditions of employment as being within the remit. Um, so will this also include a review of remuneration levels as well as compensation for additional hours? I think you've answered that question. It will. Yes, it would. Um, and how additional hour, hours work to compensate? If so, what information <coughs> will to conduct this review and how will it be collected? Well, I think. Yeah. We're going to have the, it's all going to be through the filter of that consultation group, and then Mercer spec Mercer pull together the formal value. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I really want to emphasise the work health and safety aspects uh, to this. So, for instance, somebody who said, oh, "I'm very happy to work extremely long hours as long as I'm paid a lot of money for it," we would have to look at it and say, "Well, but can we let them work a whole lot of hours from the a context fatigue, of fatigue, fatigue I mean, I want we we we, sh we I want to traverse fatigue a little bit because it's uh it's a subject I don't think we've adequately grappled with, either from a staff or member's point of view, but we'll, we'll go there in a minute. Um, any other research to be conducted with members and staff as part of the review? No, the consultation group is the primary mechanism, but we're very open to if there was uh, other jurisdictions that uh, mm. you wanted to bring to our attention or any other information. We. Uh, we are trying to run this as a really open exercise. To we're keen on getting to the right outcome. So okay, yeah. all right, yeah, I think that that might be helpful. Um, the lower house members have brought to my attention that MPs apparently no longer have the choice to pay staff performing higher duties a higher rate based on their experience. On the old pay performs, MPs have the choice to pay employees stepping up to higher duties. Um, in a in a or a higher rate, but apparently this is not an option on the online forms anymore. Uh, in terms of the LC, that would only apply to members with multiple staff. Um, is this going to be part of the discussion and will it be investigated as part of the review in terms of remuneration and regrading? Uh, I mean, all uh, the, the short answer to that is yes. I'm not aware of any change to the policy, you. though, but, and uh, well, I this don't is, really this want to was get into the, the lower house was by context on and that the, it was specifically refers to the LC in terms of yeah yeah uh, so yeah all all, all um, uh, things that contribute to conditions of employment are within the scope of the of the review and just just uh, as a point of curiosity coming out of that question what was there any reason why that option was excised um, off the form uh, as that's to do with the LA um, uh, Probably not appropriate yeah. for this uh, forum, but uh, there was never an option with the LC, was there? No, because uh, uh, secretary research assistants are all at the one, uh, yeah. one level. Uh, so, if, for example, so for example, in my office, if my senior staff were to go off and the other staff were to perform high duties, I wouldn't have the option to ask for those high duty pay, would I? No, no, no that's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> So on, on commencement for all members' staff, there's an evaluate. There's a set of criteria about what level, uh, year one, year two, year three, year four. Yeah. Uh, there's things like uh, uh, what qualifications they have, various other uh, criteria. That's done on um, that's done on uh, commencement of employment, uh, and then 
Once they've done that, they then move through, like any public servant would, uh, each year move up to the next uh, level. Until they How get do you there. address that where uh, one of his staffers, the senior person, leaves for, say, three months mm. and the other person steps up and fills that role for three months? So uh, you're talking about the whips? Uh, well, the whips is an example. Yeah. The leader of the opposition is an example. Yeah, definitely... that's right. So somebody stepping into that role for a period of time would be paid at that level. Okay. Yeah, because it's a different role. Uh, yeah. you know, it's a, you've got an SRA and you've got a WIPS uh, uh, staffer. If someone was stepping in to do the WIPS role, they would be paid at the level that the WIPS uh, uh, staffer are paid at. Different role. Even though they were... Cross-management. You know, the staff were at lower level. Um, uh, yeah, they're acting in a job, so... Yeah, so yeah, there's... Yeah, the, right. Okay, good. Um, at the last hearing... Um, Mr. Webb, uh, you said that the DPS was considering offering relief for members' staff to undertake training. Has there been any progress on offering relief for members' staff so that they can attend training sessions? Uh, so uh, where the training session is something that the Parliament has asked uh, for us to do, yes, we've been providing that. Uh, asked for them to do, we've been providing that relief. What about if the members got... Uh, as part of their allocation, members have got training on ourselves, staff, and it's deemed by the employer, which is us essentially, that they need to do the training. Is that under consideration? Uh, I, it wasn't something that we'd considered after our last session, but I am happy to consider it uh, further. Um, the uh, general training outside of things asked for by the by the um, uh, by the Parliament uh, is usually not backfilled, uh, so I just have to. But you're talking about the skills development allowance, and the yeah. The skills development. So there might be a situation where there's a there's a you know a five hundred dollar course that on Adobe or whatever that we want a staff member to attend that might it might take a couple of days and we're left without staff. I guess that's the question. Yeah. Can we get back? I, I'm happy to have a look at that. Okay. Uh, that wasn't part of my considerations previously, so I'm, I'm happy to have a look. Okay. At it. Great. Um, just a little bracket on um, on uh, leave entitlements. Actually, I'm just wondering, given we have the discussion on um, fatigue policy, chop, chopping and changing here, but um, we might we might just go into that. I think uh, if I can find out where it is, I can jump into some questions while you're looking. Yeah, you do that, Shaquette, while yeah. I find out where the hell I am. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Chair. Just a question with, with regards to library uh, matters. Um, you've indicated that the last budget estimates that uh, you will be conducting a review on the services required from Palm Tree Library. Um, what are the findings of the review? Definitely. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, over the course of the last twelve months, the Library and Research Service has been doing quite an extensive review of, uh, of the services. Uh, Many of you may have been consulted as a part of that process. So the question we asked members and members staff was, what what services do you need out of the library and research uh, uh, service? Um, as a result of that, in in broad strokes, because I don't I don't want to take up too much of your time, uh, there was a heavier emphasis on research uh, services and fact, uh, if you like, checking, um, and slightly less uh, emphasis on. Not many people were saying they're going to come down to the library and borrow a book. There was still some of that, but not as much. Uh, so the team's gone through a really a comprehensive exercise to uh, shift uh, the balance of the work that they do to put more emphasis on the research and uh, sort of fact-finding and, and the rest, and uh, less emphasis on some of the areas that people had indicated they're not using as much as they used to. I'd like to really emphasise no job losses or anything along those lines. This is just shifting, yeah. shifting uh, where we're putting the balance of our effort. Uh, I anticipated in. my next yes, question. Yes, yeah, that's the right. So, positions uh, of staff and librarians. Yeah, no, 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 no job losses at all. No uh, downgrades of positions or anything like that. But some people are working on different jobs than they were doing uh, before. The librarians that were helping members. Yep. Other staff. In the library yeah. now are shifted to do some other work, but yeah. are not losing. Not outside work. of the library, yeah, that's yeah. right. So they're, they're doing a bit more work, uh, like I said, a little bit more emphasis on research and fact finding for people, and uh, uh, that and that just reflect what what the membership told us 
was what they valued most. In I have to research. say, my experience of the research and is has been by and large excellent. It's like, fantastic. It's really yeah. good. It's really and good. so the kind of things people ask for. So as well as shifting emphasis onto some more research, people also indicated uh, by necessity our research service are generalists uh, in the past uh, because there's there's only been half a dozen of them and uh, you, you couldn't afford to have say an economic specialist or a, or a um, you know, an energy specialist or things like that. So one of the other things that came out of the review is that uh, members told us that they would like to see more specialised uh, knowledge, to have access to more specialised knowledge. So we're using that to guide future recruitment. But also we put a bid into Treasury, which Treasury supported for a pilot of a program where we set up a panel of external experts in areas. Um, in particular, we're going to focus on support to committees in the first uh, instance, but the idea would be that if you were, as a committee, you might have had experts give evidence as witnesses, but often experts uh, yeah, coming in as witnesses are coming because they have a particular um, uh, point that they want to make in, in giving their evidence. Um, the option would be available to a committee to call upon this external panel of experts to provide expert advice to the committee to help them make sense of what 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 is in front of them. So that they're just a couple of examples of where we're just trying to um, make that uh, research service deeper, richer, and and provide better service for for, for members around that around that. Review available for members. Ah uh, yes, we'll be putting something out in the next week or so uh, about it. So the the work's complete. Uh, everyone's done, and I really want to take the opportunity to commend the team uh, for the work that they did. That it was a thorough, deep process. I won't pretend there weren't disagreements along the way. People had different views on, on where the balance should be, but everyone worked together in a really, uh, really mature and with the best interests of the parliament at heart. And this, I think this outcome is an excellent outcome for the parliament. How many, um, uh, what's the number of uh, FTEs that we have in the library? In the library, uh, I am sure I have that somewhere in my folder and, uh, or someone will type it to me. I'll, I will come back and tell Are you. Are there any current vacancies? Um, uh, there are always vacancies uh, around the place at any given time, but in the library? Uh, uh, I'll library check services? on whether there's anything. I'm not aware of any advertised in the library at the moment, but I will. I will check. So on FTEs that. versus vacancies, because we're trying to get a feel for the f yeah. the flux as opposed to mm. not backfilling in an expedient matter. I guess. Oh, yeah. No, that's fair. I'm happy to provide that on notice. Okay, thank you. Uh, I sh before I go into fatigue management, something occurred to me before when uh, Shaquette was asking about um, Hansard. So am I correct in saying that the reason that the technology, the closed captioning, which is this whole AI stuff is going to be something that the parliament's going to have to grapple with because it's going to affect society yeah. on such a dramatic level very yeah. much more quickly than we're prepared for, I suspect. Yeah. But this is an emblematic issue for us. Um, so with the, clo the advent of closed captioning, you mentioned it's going to speed things up. Yeah will allow uh, more productivity, presumably. But am I right in saying that because of the increased demand on Hansard um, with committee work as well as the chamber, that the demand will look after the supply of labour, even notwithstanding the technology? Is that is that like is that why we're on safe ground there? That's the expectation. Okay, absolutely. Right. Um, I, and just uh, and I think I mentioned this at last estimates, but we've almost doubled the size of the Hansard team in the last two years. Um, it's gone from 20 FTE to 36 FTE in the last two years. Now, um, some of that resource is temporary uh, resource uh, because that's the funding uh, that we've that we've got, but that's to deal with the demand issues and fatigue management issues uh, as well. So we we are absolutely committed to making sure that we're doing everything we can to advocate for a Hansard that's able to do their job safely um, and um, and and within reasonable. Uh, with reasonable pressures uh, that are going on uh, okay, as well. Uh, so let's go into fatigue management. So in the <coughs> October round of estimates, we heard um, from you, Mr Webb, that there would be consultation with member staff about the new fatigue management policy after uh, a new <coughs> fatigue management policy had been rolled out for DPS staff. Yep. Um, can we get an update on the parameters of, of that? Of that fatigue management policy and where that's up to in terms of uh, consultation with member staff? Um, it was uh, put to us, which I think was a very reasonable point, that, that those fatigue management considerations should be included in the review we were talking about earlier because it's it's intimately bound into the conditions of employment uh, yes. and everything that would be done as a part of that. So we, we've agreed to uh, include that consultation as part of the broader... So the Edwards 
for want of a better word, review will yeah, will include that. Yes. Okay. And in terms of just that parameters of that current DPS fatigue management, can you just give us a rough idea of the, the kind of macro parameters that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Work. And David might like to comment uh, as well because it does cover the staff of their LC. David, so did you want to start off? Yes. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so I've got the policy in front of me at the moment. It applies to parliamentary staff, so the staff of the three departments and contractors. Um, essentially, at its heart, it um, reinforces the responsibilities of, well, the parliamentary executive, but particularly of managers in each area to be responsible for identifying, assessing and controlling the risks around fatigue. Um, there, there's some detail in relation to a, a sort of a sleep-wake model as one tool that can be used in identifying those risks. But if I can give you an example as to how it's playing out in the LC. Um, with the frequency of very late sitting nights, so looking at, thinking back to those sitting weeks in October and November where we frequently had a midnight finish on both a Tuesday and a Wednesday, um, the implementation of this policy in the procedure office resulted in us um, essentially uh, sending home half the team at 10pm on a Tuesday, uh, the other half of the team staying out until the bitter end and being responsible for the publication of the uh, business I, I hope you're not referring to and my German speech. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not, uh, Mr. Buttigieg. Um, and then um, uh, the team who's gone home at 10 p.m. on the Tuesday, being the team that stays till the very end on the Wednesday. Um, so, so this goes to the nub of it. But is that an adequate um, yeah. response? Um, uh, <coughs> ideally, um, uh, we we wouldn't have sittings go that late. So frequent. Well, this is this, this is something I think we need to tease out because this is a um, a, a stopgap <coughs> approach, which is laudable because it's necessary. I, I think what we're saying, aren't we, is, is that it's almost impossible to comply with a modern day fatigue policy and have the sitting patterns we've currently got. Um, Absolutely. It would that would that is that is that the frank uh, Mr. Buttigieg, That's yeah. a, as a clerk. That's my right. experience. Yeah. Um, um, we, like I'm sure all of you, are to be frank, absolutely smashed at the end of those sitting weeks in October and November last year, and it's it's frankly not sustainable. So, I guess the 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 backup question to that is is that have we have we sought any legal advice about the um, the responsibilities that would be slated at home in the event of something happening, because all this is we all, we all know as sensible people this is where, what we need to do and deal with. But ultimately, if this is tested in a court of law, um, are we as members responsible for our staff um, ensuring that they're not too fatigued? What happens if a member has an accident? Where where does this all go? I mean. This is what we have to grapple with if we don't sort this out pretty quickly, I would have thought, because sooner or later, as much as I hate to admit it, something will happen. Yes, I think we had a fairly fulsome discussion at the last estimates in, in relation to this, and Crown solicitor, Solicitor's advice had been sought. Mm. And it's a joint responsibility, if you recall, that the discussion, and a joint responsibility in relation to member staff in that uh, Parliament has a responsibility so far as... Uh, the, the general working environment uh, and uh, the member has a responsibility in relation to the specific working environment, the hours, if you like, that a staff member's working. Uh, as to what happens, you know, if the, the house imposes a sitting pattern uh, that um, and, a, and a member makes decisions about a staff member and the hours they work and, and, uh, uh, and that, then suddenly something happens to that staff member or to that member, well, that would be depend on the particular circumstances and, and I think the advice uh, is unclear about what might happen. It, it would be up to the coroner or, or a court should there be a litigation to determine a precise outcome but I 
think the clear advice is there is a joint responsibility and obviously uh, it's important that, um, that Parliament uh, provides a, a, a safe work environment as much as humanly possible. Uh, obviously the vagaries of the House deciding when it sits and you, you know that I'm on the record very clearly about needing to revise that, sitting to 12 for 12.30 on a regular basis is just not sustainable, not, not only for members and their staff but for all the, all the, the wonderful staff of Parliament. So fatigue management is still a very real issue. We're trying to manage it operationally, as, as the clerk and Mr Webb have pointed out, um, and that will continue to be the case. But at the end of the day, the parliament is, a, is its master in relation to the sitting of the House, or the chamber is, and that will again uh, be uh, something that needs to be addressed, to how it comes out in a legal case, or indeed, uh, if should, I hope that never happens, but will be obviously a balancing of all those issues and the particular circumstances. So the, 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 mem the, the situation of the member's staff is um, somewhat more definable, I think, in terms of, as you say, joint responsibility, but I would have thought the member would have had a degree of... In terms of the member themselves, mm. given that the House is the master of its own destiny, you could imagine a situation where if a member had an accident and the spouse wanted to sue, potentially potentially the whole house would be in the gun legally, right? I mean, is, was that part of the Crown Solicitor's advice or not? Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the advice uh, because we were focusing on members' responsibilities to, to their staff right. uh, through, that, uh, through that advice process. But I, I, I don't think what you're saying is unreasonable. Members are not employees of the... Of the Parliament and have a collective capacity to set uh, those conditions. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that that would be taken into account in determining where the liability for a situation would be found. Is there any possibility of us getting an addendum to that advice to that effect? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay, great. Um, I might just, Shaquette, do you want to yeah, go over the technology? I can jump over to, um, thank you, um, Chair, um, this is in, in relation to allocation of technology. Um, I know the presiding officers do not control how many devices are issued to MPs and MLCs. Uh, it's more in the domain of the um, PRT. Uh, however, uh, given what um, Webb was telling us earlier about the success of the Wi-Fi and so forth, um, our staff, who are one staff, uh, has allocated one laptop uh, where we know that a number of MPs, MLCs, have uh, multiple staffers who share the job. Um, don't you uh, think, Mr. President or Mr. Webb, um, um, that having and using a mobile phone and laptop is now an essential requirement for carrying out the role of Secretary of Research Assistant? Um, uh, so this issue has been raised. You're quite, you're quite right. The um, if you go back to our desktop computing days, it was one computer per one desk. Uh, and uh, if someone was sharing that desk, they would share uh, the computer. Uh, we've been in the process, as you know, of rolling out laptops to everybody um, that works uh, across the parliament. That's still got some ways to go, uh, primarily because um, the worldwide shortage of computer uh, chips has meant that we've just not been able to physically get um, laptops as quickly as, uh, as we have been able to in the past. And as a part of that process, um, this issue of uh, people who uh, share jobs, so uh, someone that has two part-time uh, people instead of a single uh, person has come uh, up. The uh, money that we sought from Treasury was on the basis of replacing the desktop machines with laptops. So there is a financial impact, of course, if we were to go further and provide everybody uh, that was part-time. There have been times in the past where um, uh, a member might have employed five people against a single job one day uh, each and I, so I think some of those more extreme circumstances me. yeah <laughs> we, we, we would probably want to work with a member to say well if you if you're going to that extreme we might uh, even though we're doing laptops generally we might put a desktop machine in if it's if it's a more extreme circumstance but uh, but our intention is to try and be f more flexible uh, to pro provide laptops to people that are working part time. Uh, but there is a budget impact that we have to go back and, sure. and, and put forward as a part of that. Well, so. I mean, like at this point, for example, if uh, there are two staff... Yeah, splitting the, the um, 
one person will have the laptop and the other is, uh, may not have it, yeah. therefore denied access to uh, resources and so forth. Is there a plan down the track to accommodate yeah. at least two of these staff to yeah, share if, a job? If, if we can get the funding, uh, absolutely. Uh, for a couple of members, what we've suggested in the meantime is that uh, a laptop can be used as a replacement for a de desktop because we have um, uh, you know, monitors and, and all those kind of things people can plug into. So if somebody is in a situation where we haven't been able to get enough laptops, we've suggested that they use the current, the one laptop as a, essentially a desktop machine so that people can share the desk and share the computer. Our intention is to seek more funding to provide a wider range of laptops to people that are in those part-time circumstances. I just can't promise you the timing of it because A, I'm not sure how many laptops I can get how quickly and B, we do have to get some more money to buy more laptops in order to fulfil that um, uh, to fulfil that requirement. Particularly, uh, the reason I ask also, because some staff are asked for pandemic reasons, whatever reasons, to work from home. Mm. And therefore, they need that access uh, in order to be able to uh, do their job. Mm. Um, so that's a, a real consideration yeah. that ought to be taken into account. And, um, and I know this harkens back to our previous conversations, but one of the implications of uh, uh, less investment over time is that uh, up until we got some money for, as part of the digital transformation uh, process, we just didn't have any money to buy uh, laptops. In fact, uh, computers that were meant to last for four years, we ended up stretching out to five years and in some time six years because we didn't have the money to even replace the desktop uh, uh, machines. So it's only been in the last 18 months that we've actually had any funding at all to start doing a mass purchase of, uh, of uh, laptops. Does it require you to submit an application to the PRT? It, it will, uh, no, it will require a submission to Treasury. Treasury. To Treasury, yeah, to get money. Yeah, that's right. The PRT... Much easier to get it from the PRT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> easier. Speaking from experience. Okay. The, the PRT only makes vague comments about, just as uh, members should have the equipment they need to do their job. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. uh, it doesn't. It doesn't go down to specifics saying you will have a laptop, you will have a, a phone, etc. So, um, uh, so then it becomes a negotiation between us and Treasury about what resources we can get to uh, provide equipment to to, to members. Um, the you'll recall at the very start of the pandemic, most people didn't have a portable. Device and, and a lot of people were attempting to work from home using things like Citrix uh, and the like, uh, which was very very uh, difficult. So, the process we've been going through to um, to roll out better technology, I think, has improved greatly in the last eighteen uh, months. But uh, uh, we've still got a ways to go. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Okay. I understand that in the last budget estimates, Mr. Webb, you also said uh, you would consider the issue of staff having an update uh, to update their phone devices. Uh, yes, so... Is that up to? Oh, oh, sorry. Hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, uh, sorry, I should uh, check in more often. Um, the, uh, uh, yes, so we have... Mind yes, we have had a, a look at that. Um, the uh, electoral allowance provided to members is meant to cover uh, things like uh, uh, phone plans for staff and the like. Um, so that has been one of the issues that we've been looking uh, at. More recently, uh, just recently, uh, the PSA made a submission to the uh, PRT, as I understand it, on this uh, on this issue of technology that's uh, provided to uh, members. So we'll certainly be available to talk on, on that uh, issue. But right now, the entitlements provided to members when it comes to the electoral allowance is meant to cover issues, the, the old part of the logistic support allowance, you might recall, which covered things like this, was moved into the electoral allowance back in 2016, and that's, that's meant to be the source of funds for things like phone plans uh, for staff. But also some have devices that are not compatible with our systems. Uh, yes, the move to Microsoft 365, which you've all done, has greatly increased the capacity for people to be able to access uh, email and, and various other things through vir virtually any uh, device. So um, that's part of our plan is to improve the underlying infrastructure such that people can use a wider array of... So I was talking to someone the other day, for instance, that uses a MacBook uh, Air at, at home. The move to Microsoft 365 has meant that they can more seamlessly access their email, et cetera, from that, from that MacBook, whereas previously they would have had to come in through Citrix. Citrix was uh, 
sometimes a bit medium when it came to uh, the Apple uh, computer uh, range. Now with Microsoft 365, they're able to seamlessly access um, uh, access their uh, mail where previously it was difficult. We're also we're rolling out OneDrive, uh, which is a cloud-based storage area. So if you're sharing information with your staff, it's it can be done through the cloud uh, now, so that you've got much more portability. And again, that can be done on a much wider array array of advice. Uh, there's also plans to update the identity management processes. So cybersecurity is a is a large area. And uh, Mr. Buttergee, before when you were asking about major projects for next year, I should have uh, mentioned a major cybersecurity initiative that we're kicking off uh, at the moment, which will go into next year uh, too. Uh, these move to Microsoft 365, the improvement of cybersecurity will give uh, capacity for people to be much more flexible in how they access the technology. So that's certainly top of mind for us as we move forward. Staying on matters of staff for uh, MLCs um, and uh, uh, LI members, um, uh, when was the last time a new staff induction was offered uh, for new members staff in, in the parliament? The LC and the LA. Sorry, David, I don't want to. LC. Uh, they they happen regularly. I'm sure someone will send send through the details of the precise date of the last one. Um, I think they're run about quarterly these days. Um, they're run remotely. Um, the chief executive and I address uh, the new staff, and um, um, uh, the. Uh, they get a, a range of presentations, particularly around key HR policies um, of which they need to be aware and, and with which they need to comply. There was a, a bit of a slowdown when COVID first hit because uh, we used to do them face to face, in fact, often just in the McKell room, just outside of uh, here. And so we had to convert that all to a virtual um, induction uh, process. So there was a period of time in 2020 uh, into 2021, where we had a, I think, more like a nine-month period where we didn't have any any inductions, but we've worked out a virtual way of doing it, and we've been doing it that way uh, since. So the current process is a virtual process. It is it? until we well, hopefully we'll be able mm. to go back. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to go back to face to face soon. Now that people are returning to the uh, returning to the building. What was that one on? Um, That's the induction for staff. Yeah. Oh, onboarding. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we've got an automated onboarding process for the paperwork, but we also run a induction session, um, uh, which covers all the things you'd expect. You done? All right. Um, just a couple of issues pertaining to um, the parliamentary uh, safety in the precinct. Um, so back in October again, <clears throat> um, both. Uh, Mr. Webber and the President said you would make representations to the Royal Botanic Gardens, and this is something I've been going on about for a while now, regarding the safety of Hospital Road. This is I, I noticed they've reduced the speed limit to 30, I think it was 40. Um, but uh, that parking bay still worries me. Nothing's been done about it. So there's as you come up Hospital Road, past the hospital on your left, um, there was there's a... A, a row of bikes and it impedes the approaching visibility of the pedestrian. So if someone's coming up from the domain quite quickly to cross that pedestrian crossing over into the hospital and you're not concentrating, uh, it, it'd be easy to clean someone up. And it, on the right. Yeah, on the right. Yeah. Where right. are we at with that? Uh, so yes, I've written to um, uh, the... Uh, head of the Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust and brought the issue to their attention and offered to meet with them. Uh, I haven't heard back yet, but I will be following up with them to, uh, to address the issue with them directly. But I have written to them. Okay. All right. So we're going to have a follow-up when? Uh, uh, we'll be following up every couple of weeks until we get an answer. Uh, uh, okay. Along, so. Well... If you want me to call them direct, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, an incident concerned me, which I've already raised with the President. Last year, there was a, a rally outside the Parliament. This is in one of those blisteringly hot days, which seems like a distant memory now, but I think it was the teachers' strike. We had thousands upon thousands of people out there. A young uh, woman 
young girl was escorted to the front of the protest on this side of uh, Macquarie Street to the curb because she was feeling very faint, almost about to pass out. And paramedics couldn't get up to her because of the crowd. And we were right outside that big raw tine gate. We couldn't unlock the thing to get her into a cool environment and give her some water and get her some medical attention. And the poor old constables were running around looking for the key. And it seemed like what seemed like an eternity before they finally found the key and got it open. I was just concerned in terms of protocol access to that gate would be important in situations like that. You have to... Is that all being sorted out? Uh, while I... Um while uh, we don't comment publicly on security arrangements in Parliament, the particular issues that you're talking about have been addressed. But I don't want to go into details on it, uh, but happy to talk to you offline. OK. About it. All right. Uh, while um, Mark is flicking through, um, I, can, uh, I would like to raise this issue that, um, that may be the case now, I'm not sure, same situation where uh, there was a protest at the front and... Um, uh, visitors were asked to uh, enter from Hospital Road. So I had a constituent who wanted to see me, so I went to collect them. Um, you know, they came through the security. Um, I, I I'm not sure whether he was carrying a bag or not, but in any event, um, the person walked through with me, uh, no security checks, and no check on the bag. I think there was, I'm not sure about in other words, the security mechanisms there weren't activated. Mm. Um, if people um, are now, as, as today, also asked to come through uh, the security section on level six <laughs> at um, uh, Hospital Road, um, are they being checked? Um, uh, I'm very happy to talk to you offline about this, but in the public forums, I don't. Uh, talk about security measures of the, of the of the parliament, but very happy to talk to you offline uh, about it. All right. Um, I, uh, I just want to raise some ancillary um, things. Don, I'm just conscious that uh, we're about 15 minutes away. Do you have anything you wanted to go over before I... Well, all these, uh, many of the questions, not all the questions, many of the questions are useful questions and... Um, them to be asked rather than uh, going to one or two of the matters I was going to raise. But okay, thanks. We'll just play it by ear. Sure. Um, now, another matter I've raised with the President, the issue of the Neville Rand bus being squirrelled away. Well, if you're going to raise, raise that, then I'll definitely ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's dreadful. Well, what, what's dreadful? The fact that it's hidden away or the bust? No, no the bust. <laughs> Sorry. I could not possibly comment. Anyway, well, please. Regardless of the aesthetic <laughs> qualities of the bust or not, I, we'd be aware that it was a gift from the Italian community. Yes. Uh, now, my understanding is, is that it was out in that uh, forecourt area, the fountain area, <laughs> for about 10 years. And then a couple of years ago, it was squirreled away. Yes. Um, not sure who made that decision. I, I, I exactly Mark is desperate to answer this, so I, I might just sure. pass it to him. Um, there was... I don't want to have to go through the pain of running a, a campaign with the Italian community <laughs> to have a well, then I'll get <laughs> so um, the um, uh, So a uh, decision was made uh, a while back to rotate the location of the bust of Neville Rand. Uh, as you say, it was in the forecourt for some time. It's been in the parks room uh, most recently. Uh, I've been talking with the facilities team about where the next uh, stop in the rotation uh, would be. Um, suggestions have been made uh, around the uh, Level 10 uh, area uh, so that uh, members that are based on Level 10 can enjoy the bust or the opposition party room as being another potential uh, location and it's the next stop on its, um, on its uh, passage around the building but always very happy to talk about potential locations. So, the, so the, the answer to the question, will the bus be moved back to its rightful place, is no. Uh, the rightful place being in the fountain court. Well, 
I mean, in the context that it was a gift from the Italian community, I would imagine that they would want the public to see it since they donated it, not just Labor members who know how great that bust is. Uh, the... Um, uh, Lou Amato would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, he, he's torn. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, no, no, for the Italian part's terrific. Just the Labor thing, I agree, with being moved. Wrong <laughs> um, comment. You'll, you'll note that um, the Fountain Court, uh, at the moment we don't have any, uh, we have uh, artworks on the wall, but we don't have any um, uh, permanent displays uh, that are uh, things like uh, statues or, or uh, other sort of sculptured uh, works from that point of view. Um, and uh, so we're very happy to work with people about what the right place for the, for the um, a bust would be, but I at this stage I don't think the fountain court uh, would. I don't think it would fit in with where the fountain court is in terms of not having any statues uh, in it. Um, can I ask then a question about a matter which a number of members have raised with me, which they feel three quite upset room. with? Um, when uh, this bill, this room um, was, oh, okay. was built. And uh, when anyways, no? yeah, yeah, uh, the, uh, the room across the, the corridor from here was built and further um, changes were made uh, in terms of the old catering office, mm. there was a, um, a decision that was taken in terms of the naming policy uh, where um, uh, a former Labor Premier and Governor-General and a former broadly speaking, from the Liberal side of politics. <laughs> Take a photo. <laughs> Premier, Prime Minister and High Commissioner... Too late. You do that again? ...were, um, uh, uh, were chosen to be um, uh, commemorated in a bipartisan sort of way. So that Mikel would be... Um, uh, there would be a Mikel room uh, and uh, uh, money was spent on acquiring artwork for that building. Uh, and the Reed Room was established and money was, uh, well, uh, spent on uh, acquiring some art or uh, art uh, work uh, celebrating uh, Reed for that room. I notice that during COVID, the Reed Room has been stripped of all of its artwork uh, and that it is no longer in use um, uh, and is now just merely a storeroom. Um, uh, when is the Parliament planning to reinstitute the Reed Room uh, so that uh, it's, uh, it can be... I know, I think, at one stage, uh, uh, a section of Labor Party members used to... Uh, uh, sitting members used to rent it quite regularly, uh, and there's certainly been other occasions where other members wanted to use it. When is it going to be... Um, uh, reinstated as it should be as the read room and made available for use? Uh, that, that's in process at the moment. Uh, it, while we did the work on the strangers uh, dining area where everything had been pulled down, you're quite right, we did use the read room to store uh, some things while that work was going ahead. But now that that work is complete, we're in the process of restoring the read room. Uh, I just want to go to the perennial um, issue of the, the <coughs> staff dining. Um, I think last budget estimates, Mr Webb, said that you didn't think there was capacity for the Parliament to introduce dedicated dining space for staff, but that you would consider it. I just want to know, has there been any thought, further thought along those lines? And in a follow-up question, um, why is it not possible for the staff to have access to, for example, the carvery or even the restaurant food if extra room can't be provided, dedicated for them, and they could eat that same quality of food in the cafe area. I think, I think the, the general issue is, is that we have staff working long hours. Um, a part of the rest and relaxation to keep you going is to have a decent meal in a nice, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a space. And we really should try and address this because I think historically they did get access, didn't they, to those member facilities? Uh, there was a long time ago, uh, well, well before my time, a staff yeah, dining so, room. So the room that is currently the Macquarie room uh, was originally the staff dining room. 
uh, it was converted into a purpose um, uh, equipped committee hearing space when um, when the demand for for meeting rooms for committees became such that uh, an additional room was required. When was the decision taken to stop staff booking in the strangers' dining? There's no. Uh, so that, I was going to say staff can book uh, a, a, a table in the strangers' dining room. No change uh, to that. You're absolutely correct. You also note that the that mark so that they could book. Yes, I that's right. Totally agree with you. Yeah. No, that's right. So. Uh, staff can always book a, a table in the strangers' uh, dining, uh, strangers' restaurant, uh, as a part of that. You also have noticed that the um, themed buffet nights that we've been yes. uh, running do have access to staff as well. Uh, so we are trying to find different ways to provide access for staff. Um, uh, always happy to consider any uh, suggestions uh, along those uh, lines. Uh, if there was demand for us to extend the carvery such that there was a members Dining part and, a, and a others dining, I, I'm sure that's something that we could absolutely consider. Okay. Um, I, think, I think if we could maybe use the JCC to kick around a few of those things, that would be awesome. good. Yeah. And, and as a mem sample member of staff and to compliment Mark and all his wonderful <coughs> catering team on the work they do, yeah. those themed evenings on Wednesday during sitting weeks... Um, I've certainly taken advantage of them, and uh, the food is fantastic. Yeah, apparently it's been well received, but I think there's a desire to have that extended. And yeah, no, that's right. And and this is another example where great feedback from members and staff has been taken into a, into account. So um, uh, some people uh, some people love the strangers' restaurant experience, and the, it's a fine dining uh, option. But we did get the feedback that they also wanted. Uh, uh, simpler options uh, at other times. So sometimes you want fine dining, sometimes you want something a bit simpler. And we've tried to make sure, you know, members only specials in the, in the members dining room, which are usually a simpler uh, uh, option, uh, looking at what's available through the cafe uh, in the evenings and these themed uh, nights as well as just giving options to people. So if, you, if you've got a, some guests and you want a fine dining experience, then Strangers is the go. I'll, I'll put that down as a placeholder to, to get some feedback and solutions, but I just want to squeeze one in before I hand over to, to Shaquette. The e-returns, I understand there's a level of maturity on that project in terms of, you know, SA52s and whatnot electronically. Um, was there a point? Was there a point in time where you were going to come back to us as members with a, an outline of where it's at and what we think? Um, just to give you a very brief update, um, there are three stages to the project. Uh, stage one uh, has been completed in a sense that's one of the most complex stages. It involves uh, that has involved the building of a portal and facility for the uploading of documents by the executive. And um, I understand from my staff who have uh, seen a demonstration very recently, it's, it's really outstanding, that work that's been done. The third stage is, uh, is coming up. And um, uh, in, the, in order to um, move forward, um, uh, various uh, very detailed business needs need to be articulated and there will be a process of consultation uh, involved in, in that. Um, if I can just give you some, some other good news, as well as the fact that that, that first complex stage has been complete, um, as late as late last week I um, engaged uh, with DPC um, to um, emphasise um, uh, the importance of the project and to ensure their continued engagement with the project and um, I was really pleased by the level of engagement that is continuing. Okay. So if there's any major issues, um, it's not like we've gone too far down the track before they can be teased out with the members is what I suppose... Uh, not at all. And in, in, in fact, there's one, <coughs> one of those points of details that needs to be teased out in relation to stage three um, is a matter that's um, likely to be um, considered by the procedure committee in the in the next few weeks. Um, so again, you'll you'll no doubt hear, hear about that. Thank you. I'll have um, we've got three very quick questions, um, and that will conclude 
Um, my questions. Uh, one regards to, or one uh, raised security issues with regards to the special constable box at the hospital road, other than to say that the apparently uh, there's no working air conditioning in that um, security box. Uh, there is air conditioning in that box. Um, it's not uh, working. I will. I will. It's not been raised with me that it's not working, so I will definitely look into that. And if is at the moment they're using fans as opposed. Yeah, to we will. We will make sure if there's something that needs to be fixed, we'll make sure it gets fixed. Thank you. The next one is with regards to the uh, countdown clocks. Uh, apparently, um, Mr. Webb, you uh, indicated last that in February this year there would be countdown clocks available in each room for budget estimate hearings. Uh, yes. I can't see it. No, you're quite right, and I do apologise for that. The audiovisual uh, project uh, has had trouble sourcing equipment uh, in the worldwide um, shortage on computer chips, uh, and the countdown clocks were an unfortunate um, victim of that. Uh, we are super committed. I thought you might... Uh, someone might ask me about it. We are very committed to making sure the next estimates does have the countdown clocks in, and I do apologise. I did make that promise last time, and I wasn't able to keep it. No, uh, no, thank you. Thanks for the answer. And the last one, um, um, you can take this one on notice. Uh, what proportion of items procured for the Parliament are sourced in New South Wales? I'll take it on notice, but uh, I will say just that our general policy, uh, which has been this way for a long time, is to seek New South Wales sourcing first. If we can't source in New South Wales, to source in Australia, and only in those times where we can't uh, source in Australia. To source go, locally uh, first. Yeah, locally first and then expand uh, out. But I'll get you some exact figures. I do have a couple of quick answers to things that you asked that I uh, wasn't able to answer, but I'll just do quickly. Uh, 16 staff in FDE in the library and 10 in the research uh, service. So that's uh, 26 in total across both those areas. Mr. Amato, I'm pleased to say I was wrong about the Legionnaires' disease thing. It's quarterly that we check it, not uh, not twice a year, four that's, times that's a good year. Idea. So I'm uh, one of those times where I'm very happy uh, to have, uh, have been uh, wrong uh, in that. And uh, the parliamentary librarian uh, tells me that there are a couple of vacancies in the library that were waiting on the finalisation of the review. Now that that's happened, all of those positions will be advertised in the next couple of weeks uh, to be to be filled. So uh, there's just a little bit of uh, quick info to cover off some of you asked. Thank you. And the client and, has something too. And just in relation to the questions about the parliamentary funding model and uh, the public accountability committee report, um, the, an interim government response was reported to the House in October, uh, which drew attention to the fact that in addition to the Public Accountability Committee report, there had also been a report on, this, on the funding models for the independent agencies by the Auditor General and that it was the government's intention to respond to both sets of reports at the same time. But extensions have been asked for on the report? <coughs> um, the President indicated to the House that in the circumstances, the, um, effectively the rationale provided in that sort of interim response was not unreasonable. Um, but, but we've received no further advice as to when a final um, response or final decisions will be communicated. I think That's you'll a, find, a having thing. been the signatory to the letter David's referring to, um, that a change in the change in um, Premier and the change in administrative orders has presented, prevented the matter being dealt with in the original draft time frames that we'd hoped. Yeah. Thank you. All right, no more questions? No more questions? Well, we'll well, we've come, to, we've, come yeah. bit, we've come to the bitter end at 12.30, sorry. You might watch those questions on notice. Yep. So you can get the answers you need. Um, I don't think there's anything taken on notice that hasn't been dealt with. There might be a couple. Okay, well, if that's the case, you... Uh... Um, I think I asked for a couple of um, you did, uh, you did. matters okay. to be dealt with on, on notice. And is it possible to have them read back just so that I make sure that I miss anything? Uh, I had notes on um, any correspondence. Uh, you wanted confirmation about whether the interaction with uh, Mr. Anderson happened either verbally or 
uh, it's like meeting or, or in letters, and if it was uh, in a written form, you wanted copies of uh, yeah, correspondence. And um, I uh, would also be appreciate the, a copy of the advice that the heritage uh, yes. architect provided the parliament. Mm -hmm. Yep, around the door. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, thank you. Note that you've got 21 days to respond. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.